That was very deftly handled. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Kathleen Nesset. I'm the chair of the State Board of Higher Education. I'm going to begin with uh, some safety issues. First off, if there is an emergency, our exits are out either door here or in the back of the room. And Lisa has told me even though it says men's room, it is still an exit over there. So you are allowed to go out that way. I would introduce dignitaries, but to be quite honest with you, everybody in this room is a dignitary. So we will, uh, we will dispense with that for today. Um, I'd also like to thank the Bismarck State IT guys. This crew are once again superb. Thank you very much. We are live streaming today. I want to thank everyone who is here to help envision higher education for our future generations. I want to especially thank those of you who are speaking at our summit today, as well as those helping to lead our breakout sessions. I want to thank those who are watching via live stream. We are also very grateful to the Lumina Foundation. We have Susan and Scott here. Thank you very much. They are our hosts. Um, they are supporting the expenses um, for this event through a grant, and they are also sp uh, sponsoring our lunch today. Thank you very much. <laughs> our discussions today are so important to creating a future that meets the future demands of our students, our workforce, and our communities. As chair of the state board, I can assure you that our students, past, present, and future, are the reason that we serve and are central to every decision that we make to help guide our public institutions. Their success is our success. And to our board members who are sitting here up in the front two rows, I want to thank you. Every meeting that we have, we bring up the fact that the students are first. Students, colleges, and universities being in the headlines is what this is all about. When the board and the staff and the system and all of the education are doing our jobs, we are in the background, and that is our goal. We are here today to evaluate where we are and envision where we want to be. How will we meet the needs of students beginning their life of learning as preschool schoolers now and entering college in 2030. That's a quite, a quite a thought. So today, I would like to begin student-focused, and I would first like to bring forward two students. The first one to come forward from Mayville State is Taylor. Taylor, if you'd come on up and join me up front. Taylor is an incoming senior. She is just joining the senior class at Mayville State. And I'd also like to ask Brittany to come forward. Brittany, also from Mayville State, a student joining us today. Brittany has just graduated. She will go on to do some past, um, some, some master work um, in library science. Thank you very much for joining us. And now my special guest of the morning is Aiden. Aiden, would you come forward? Our guest this morning, Aiden, is 10. He is currently finishing the fifth grade. And Aiden has a couple of words to share with us. I'm happy to be here today. I'm so glad you're taking the time to be here. I think it is important that we learn from the past but focus on the future. Everyone is here today to make a better future in, in which we are all properly educated. I, for one, would like to be an aerospace engineer when I grow up. I plan to get my degree from North Dakota Institution of Higher Education because we have such great opportunities and such great teachers. I want to thank you again for being so supportive of the education of future generations. Aiden, thank you very much. That was awesome. You know, you, we were talking a little bit earlier. What's your favorite subject? Math. How about that? There's a math guy. Thank you. 
I'm going to show Aiden just a little bit. You know, a couple of you know that, you know, my, my heart and soul is in the oil and energy industry. And I have a piece of core here from the Bakken and from Williston State College, this wonderful little bottle of crude oil. And I want to show Aiden, as he studies math and he goes into aerospace, he probably has some buddies, some friends, and some, uh, some girls and some guys in that class that might want to get into geology and engineering. Um, help us figure out how to crack that rock and open up and get a little more of this crude oil out of that rock. Aiden, okay, you talk to your friends about that. And the ones who want to go into medicine and music and, and arts and science, we like that too. But you know what? North Dakota is a good place to go to school. So that's my words to you. All right? Thank you very much. You can have a seat. And thank you, Brittany and Taylor. Our students, our, chi our children, our grandchildren, our nephews, our nieces, they are our investment. And you have placed your trust in us to provide the best education possible. As we embark on this historic journey, remember that our students are the reason for today and always keep them in mind as we go through this journey. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Governor Jack Dalrymple of the great state of North Dakota. Governor Dalrymple was sworn in as the 32nd governor on December 7, 2010, and began working to grow and diversify North Dakota's economy and create good jobs and economic opportunities for her citizens. He brings to the office an outstanding record of agriculture, business, legislative and executive leadership. Since taking office, Governor Dalrymple has worked to fund the state's priorities, provide expanded tax relief for North Dakotans, and maintain strong reserves for the future. Under his leadership, more than 70,000 new jobs have been created, more than $1 billion in comprehensive tax relief has been provided to North Dakota citizens, more than $2 billion has been invested in strengthening the state's infrastructure, and North Dakota has led the nation as the fastest growing economy and the best run state in the nation. I do recall a while where North Dakota eclipsed Hawaii as the happiest state to live in. So you cannot tell me they all come here for the weather, Governor. It must be that business-friendly culture that we have, and thanks to you and your great leadership. Please help me and welcome Governor Jack Dalrymple. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kathy, thank you very much. And, uh, uh, some of those statistics are even a little bit old. They, they're even better than they used to be. Uh, I don't know about the happiest state, uh, you know, when you beat out Hawaii and you haven't even legalized marijuana, that is a heck of an accomplishment. Uh, they have this edge all the time on that particular survey. It's, it's an honor for me to uh, be in front of you this morning and uh, I agree with Kathy, there are too many dignitaries uh, to introduce, and uh, besides, I'm not on the ballot anyhow this year, so I can <laughs> do whatever I want. Uh, but I do, I do want to mention a couple of names. One is, uh, well, there's this little rule that we started years ago, and that is you never fail to mention the lieutenant governor. And uh, so I've tried to keep that tradition up uh, I have, without a doubt, in Drew Wrigley, the very best lieutenant governor in the nation since the last lieutenant governor. And he'll, let's give him a little round of applause. Seriously, Drew is, is a, a huge help, and you couldn't, couldn't have a better guy in that spot. Also want to remind uh, all of you uh, who is our senior staff person on uh, education, and that uh, is someone that most of you know, but maybe not everybody. So I'm going to ask uh, Kayla Efforts to just stand for a second and uh, say hello to everybody. Yeah. OK, I'm going to uh, try to do this. A uh, little PowerPoint here behind me. 
glad to see we're not wasting money on our auto audiovisual uh, budget, uh, and that's good. Um, I'm going to do a sort of or just a kind of a, a walkthrough of the past, the present, and the future in higher education. This is really a great opportunity to have all these people together in one room. And uh, you don't know how many people I run into who say, boy, if I could just get all those higher ed people together, I'd give them a piece of my mind. And, uh, you know, it's a rare occasion uh, that you're really all together in one place like this. Uh, and I immediately told Kayla, we should do something this morning. We should, like, decide something that we're all here together. But uh, we'll see. Maybe something will come out of our talks. I think it's working. Okay, little history first. Uh, just to remind you, um, this all began really where we are today with the Board of Higher Education and all of you. Uh, when a governor from Castleton uh, fired the president of the uh, Agricultural College, of course, uh, NDSU today, and six of their high-ranking officers, uh, and really, uh, he did it in a spirit of uh, populism. Uh, he was a supreme politician, William Langer, and in those days, it was an extremely popular move. They didn't have polls in those days, but I'm sure his numbers shot up immediately. And it was quite, quite the scandal. Uh, it was called a purge, and uh, NDSU, or the AC, uh, immediately lost its accreditation. And things, uh, you know, were pretty much up for grabs. So, uh, what happened next? Uh, if I can get to a new slide. What happened next was uh, there was a petition put together, and an initiated measure came on the ballot. And what do you know? Uh, people said, uh, we got to get this away from the politicians immediately. This has gotten completely out of hand. Uh, we need a board of higher education. We need to have a special group that administers our, our institutions. And uh, board members, you've been here ever since. And, uh, you know, born out of crisis, but, uh, you know, thank you for lasting as long as you have. In 1999, uh, an important thing happened. There was a group put together called the Roundtable. It consisted of 21 legislators and 40 community leaders from around the state, uh, mostly business leaders. I so happened to be a member of that group, and uh, so did uh, uh, Governor John Hoven. And many of you in this room may have been members of the roundtable. The idea was to talk about how to do things a bit better in higher education. We had been in a kind of a back and forth period of tension and stress in higher education. Uh, lots of bad publicity, a lot of unhappiness, and frankly, uh, a lot of contention. And uh, legislators in particular uh, wanted to get to a better place. Finally, in 2001, Roundtable was launched, and we actually put into state law an interesting statute. The institutions are a unified system of higher education. Actually, it goes on to say, under the control of the board. Uh, now, that may not seem like uh, a big phrase today, uh, because that's the way it's been for quite a while now. But that was a clarification that had really never been made in state statute. And I think uh, we are you know, doing well to remember it from time to time. And 2013, I think, was also an important moment when we actually put together a new higher education funding formula and that formula uh, has aligned ourselves, I think, much better uh, with the mission of the university system, uh, where our payments are based on course completions uh, at rates that reflect the true historic costs uh, of, those, of those courses. And you will remember uh, for years the battles we had over so-called equity in higher education funding. We never seemed to get there. Uh, mostly because nobody really knew what it was. Uh, North Dakota Higher Education Roundtable came up with some sort of big picture, good
goals that uh, I think we, we should remind ourselves of from time to time. Create a new public perception of the purpose and the value of the higher education system. We did have a problem in those days uh, with people not really understanding what we were trying to do in higher education. Another big word was flexibility. Give the campuses and the presidents more flexibility to do the best job that they can. Do not tie their hands. Another big breakthrough was engaging fully the participation of the private sector. And I think uh, up until then, uh, the private sector had been sort of off to the side. And we suddenly realized for economic development, economic prosperity, the private sector needed to be right at the table with us at all times, telling us what was needed in the way of occupations and people uh, in order to create and fill uh, these great jobs that were out there. And finally, uh, an overall writing goal was uh, communicating to the general public. And we had not done that as a team before. Uh, each constituency, each group, the legislature, or a particular college had done their own advocacy. Uh, there was no kind of unified message for the whole, for the whole system. And there were six uh, cornerstones that were finally adopted. I'll just go through these quickly. Economic development connecting the system to economic growth, and social vitality, which is a term that I really like. Social vitality. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but it, it sounds great. Uh, education excellence. Prepare students to advance careers as well as be good citizens and leaders. Careers suddenly became uh, the term that we use rather than get a job. We talked again about flexible, and responsive system. Entrepreneurial was a word that uh, came into the round table. Uh, the presidents and the campuses needed to be entrepreneurial about what they were doing and not rely entirely uh, on an overriding system. Finally, uh, three other cornerstones. The system needs to be accessible. And we have, indeed, uh, geographically an incredibly accessible system, 11 campuses in a small state our size, unbelievable, uh, and now with e electronics uh, even more so. Uh, but, you know, that's not the way people always viewed it. At one time we had a measure uh, to get rid of some campuses and consolidate the entire system. And in the late 80s that measure was soundly defeated by a vote of the public. And that was, I think, a message that as inefficient as it seemed to have 11 different campuses, uh, people liked it. They liked the idea that they had access uh, to higher education throughout the state. And now, after years have gone by and we look back at it, I think we realize the great value uh, that that is. At the time, we didn't appreciate it. Uh, but today, we know that accessibility is one of our great, great strengths. The funding system, they said, needed to be geared to our high priority needs. And I think we've done a lot better with that since we revised the formula. Formula now is well aligned with the overall mission. And finally, uh, sustaining the vision. And uh, these are some interesting words. Stay connected, understood, and accountable. It's a, a group mission. Can't be done by just one part of higher education, and this includes the legislature. Uh, stay connected, and uh, that's what we're doing today, which I think is a great thing. So, uh, how has it gone? I'm going to just give you a few slides to present my case uh, that what you have done over the last 15 years uh, has been uh, truly a success. North Dakota. Gross domestic product, um, the bar graph speaks for itself. Uh, in 2015, you'll see uh, a little lower than 2014. 2016 may be flat as well. But you can clearly see we are now at a dramatically higher level than we have ever been before. Uh, 
Uh, this is the diversification of our state economy. And as you can see, uh, all sectors of our economy have grown. In spite of the fact that uh, energy and agriculture are, are huge for us, uh, we do have diversification. Uh, by the way, that top band is government, and you'll see that uh, it has not gotten any thicker. Per capita personal income, we used to be well below the national average in personal income. Uh, this is per capita. And as you can see, uh, we took off in 2009 and are now well ahead of the national average. In 2015, uh, per our per capita personal income uh, is probably down somewhat. Uh, and in 16, I'm sure it will be flat as well. But still, an incredible amount of progress in comparison to the national average. Unemployment, uh, as you can see, we skipped the national recession. The national recession had a huge unemployment problem for, for an extended period of time. We never participated, and today uh, our unemployment rate at the moment is 3.2%, still one of the lowest in the nation. And finally, population. Uh, what a pure measure of anything. Uh, 2015, again, uh, population growth. Uh, currently sitting at our all-time record population. Uh, we talked for years and years about people staying. Let's have people stay in North Dakota. Let's have people want to come to North Dakota. Uh, and this is uh, the ultimate proof. This is a combination of in-migration, uh, but also births. Uh, I saw on the paper the other day, Dickinson Trinity Hospital in April set its all-time all -time record for the hospital uh, in new births. And I was impressed with that, but then they told me that June's going to be even higher. Current job openings, and of course, this is where uh, the rubber really meets the road. Uh, we have had outstanding job openings for a number of years. Down the last few, uh, uh, the last quarter or so, uh, but currently back up again, uh, over 15,000 uh, job openings. Uh, that's what we're that's what we're looking for all the time from higher education. So I'm going to say to you, <clears throat> way to go! Uh, you set out to create jobs. You set out to supply the workforce to our uh, growing economy, and I've got to say, in many ways, these statistics would not be possible if our education system had not been delivering the people that we need to fill these new jobs. So way to go. But what should we be doing now? I think really it's more of the same and maybe doing it uh, even better than we've done it before. Uh, our Commerce Department, our Job Service, and our uh, Department of uh, Career and Technical Education uh, got together and said, uh, let's do a survey. Uh, we want to find out what are the high demand occupations in North Dakota today? And we want to use that to convey to our system of higher education. The screen that they used was uh, high school equivalent or higher education. Uh, you need a short term job growth outlook that is rated either exceptional or high growth. You need at least five openings for replacement and nine openings for new growth in the in the industry, and you need wages more than 25% above the average wage. So what comes back? A whole list of occupations uh, that we can look to uh, for guidance. This is this list that I'm going to flip through here for about a minute uh, is probably only about a third of the occupations that showed up. But just as a flavoring in education. Uh, biology teachers, in engineering, electronics engineers, in financial, loan officers, healthcare, among many others, pharmacists and physician assistants. In IT, always uh, great opportunities. Uh, I'll mention computer network support specialists. I know about that one because I'm in the capital every day 
hoping for support in my network. Um, legal assistance. Uh, in management, medical and health services managers, critically, critically needed right now. Uh, in the service uh, sector, uh, obviously, among many others, child care workers. In the, whoops, in the skilled trades, uh, always a nice long list. Uh, that seems to never change. We always have the carpenters and the electricians and the welders. They seem to always be on the list. But look at some of the other ones that we have now as well. Power plant operators, gas plant operators. Very interesting additions to uh, some of our traditional lists. Oh, I keep wanting to go to the next slide, sorry. Social services, uh, one that jumps out, unfortunately. Substance abuse and behavior disorder counselors, and also social workers in that area. Uh, we know, unfortunately, uh, a new area of high demand for us to fill. Transportation. Uh, you're always familiar with this one, mechanics of every type, and of course, uh, truck drivers never seem to come off the list. But as well as, you know, this large list that is almost like a working document, I would say, for higher education, I hope that all of you are familiar uh, that, you know, these are the occupations that we're looking to fill. Uh, we have to be mindful that there are truly first-time emerging uh, opportunities for jobs out there. And as a system, uh, I hope we're aware of it. And in that category, we see things like operations research analysts, data processing systems analysts, aircraft pilots, chemical and process plant operators and technicians. We need to be mindful. Uh, that there are job opportunities and careers that are emerging today. And we need to be watching for them, and we need to be ready for them and move quickly. So we have our targets. We know what it is we're supposed to be doing to, you know, create graduates that will fill these tremendous opportunities. Uh, but how do we go about that? How do we actually get that done? And again, we have to start with, looking a little bit at where we've been and where are we today. Under the old way, back in the pre-roundtable days, uh, the higher education community would complain uh, to us, to the legislature, that they were underfunded and overworked. Then some legislators and members of the public, not all of them, but some, uh, would come back and say, yeah, but there's too much waste in higher ed. It's inefficient. Besides, the salaries are too darn high. And then the campus response would come back very predictably. Our salaries are not competitive. Our facilities are falling apart. Our costs are skyrocketing, blah, blah, blah. And it was a vicious circle, and it would continue. And it was counterproductive and absolutely uh, did not work. It did not produce good results. Now, under the new way, we are saying, and have said now for a number of years, systems needs to stop thinking of itself as a ward of the state and take greater responsibility for its own future. And I really think you have done that. And I hope we never lose track of that. That's, that has been what's been our strength over the last decade. Each campus now has greater flexibility in budgeting and allocating resources, absolutely essential uh, to a great system. The private sector, I think, is a full partner in improving the system, but it needs to continue to be, and in fact, maybe even in a more focused way than before, where we go directly to uh, businesses and we survey them directly on what they need right now today. And finally, uh, communication continuously with the North Dakota press and public. And really, on the whole, uh, I'm going to say that I think you've done well, and we've done well. On the whole, uh, our system uh, is well regarded. We know that we have, uh, over the last, say, 10 years, 
Uh, we have had some publicity setbacks at times, um, but I think if you think about it, uh, you'll realize that they have been isolated. Uh, they have dealt with individual personalities in some cases, uh, and most of the time, uh, they dealt with small irritants uh, in the big picture. And when I say the big picture, I mean the big picture of how we have done with our overall mission. Economic prosperity and social vitality. I think that you have been successful in the big picture. The new higher education funding formula uh, has also, I think, uh, been a big help. And uh, we talked about this for years before we finally uh, had everything in a, in a situation where we could take a run at this. Very challenging to do, as you know. Uh, 11 campuses, uh, looking at it under a microscope, uh, not an easy thing to accomplish uh, legislatively. I remember talking uh, very early on with uh, Senator Flackle uh, from Fargo on how to execute this. And uh, the leadership uh, did a great job of helping us bring this along. The formula basically says we will fund you on course completions, not on enrollment. Very important principle. Every course has a reimbursement rate that's based ultimately on the actual historic costs of delivery. We're paying you for what it costs to, to do that course. Uh, and uh, really, it is the ultimate in fairness. We have factors for the size of your operation. Uh, we have factors for extra square footage if that's required for your courses. And all of that very carefully done, not by legislators, uh, not by the governor, but all worked out originally by VPs of finance and business managers uh, from the campuses. Uh, they worked. Uh, somewhat uh, under the radar for some time, uh, and that was helpful because these are delicate things, but they came to a consensus. So this formula is not from the board, uh, it's not from the governor, it was built by the campuses, and I think that's a big reason why uh, we have had credibility with it, uh, because the people who use it are the people who initially put it together. Obviously, uh, it needs to be fine-tuned constantly. Costs do change. Things do change. We need to constantly adjust. We need to constantly look at those factors and question whether they are, are still correct. But in the end, it has resolved that long-lasting debate about funding equity. And some of you remember uh, how long we went in circles over that. The formula is truly transparent. The old formula was incomprehensible to the general public. The new formula, uh, if you'd give me three minutes or less, I can explain to you what money you get and why you get it from the state of North Dakota. And I think that was, uh, that was very important. It needs to not be mysterious. The formula guards against issues of declining enrollment because the funding lags. So if you see the enrollment declining, you're still operating on the previous year's numbers and you have time to adjust. It encourages efficiency and innovation. Uh, why? Because if you save a buck on your campus, it's your dollar. You don't have to turn, turn it back to anybody. Save it, it's yours. And finally, the critical point in all this, the reason that this still and work well, even though it really encourages entrepreneurism. The board still does uh, control the course offerings in North Dakota. This is essential for our mission focus. We cannot allow campuses, obviously, to have a, have a motivation to just fill seats uh, to get money. In the end, what they propose in the way of new offerings or expansion of existing offerings uh, must be approved by the Board of Higher Education. Um, so going forward, um, what are some of the things that uh, should be talked about as we go forward? Um, 
And is, some of these things are small, and, and that, that's okay. Um, should we have a bonus uh, funding factor for new course startups? That was originally proposed uh, by the working group. Uh, the campus finance directors felt it was important. If we have no extra money for a first year startup, it acts as a deterrent uh, to innovation. And it does cost money uh, to launch a program, start a program for the first year. It's less efficient. There are upfront costs. Uh, I still believe uh, that we should reflect those costs in our formula. Another question. Do we need to adjust the reimbursement for online versus classroom delivery? Uh, today, we, we don't. Uh, is there a relative cost difference? I'm not sure we know exactly what that is. Intuitively, online seems like it should be less expensive. But is it? Uh, we should know that. Right now, it's not too much of a problem because every campus has a mix of online and traditional classroom. But going forward, there's a great potential for it to become inequitable. If one campus becomes a real centerpiece, a real center of online learning, uh, will their funding formula uh, still be appropriate? I would encourage you um, to look into that. Um, also, what about um, remedial courses? Right now, um, they have the same tuition collection, they have the same, the same state funding as any other course. Uh, should that be altered? Should it be uh, required that you pay more tuition if you need a remedial course? But we need to do something to discourage the number of remedial courses, and we don't have that built into our our funding system. Another macro goal of the funding formula, uh, full integration of state funding and tuition. This means we need to look at the entire cost of delivering that education to the student in total and make policy decisions based on the big picture. Today, if you take out the federal and outside revenue sources available to campuses, which are considerable, of course, for the research universities. The ratio of state funding in comparison to uh, tuition is 53.5% state, 46.5% uh, uh, tuition. Is that the right target? Is that the right mix? Uh, it, it needs to be constantly discussed. Obviously, you need both. You need tuition, you need students to be bought into what they're doing, uh, but you also need strong state funding. What is the right combination? In the end, this discussion becomes governed more so by competition than by philosophy. And what we learned as part of the roundtable is that when we set tuition, uh, the first place we need to look is our, comp our competitors. Uh, we have an extremely favorable uh, tuition for our four-year campuses, as you know, uh, um, among the low, lowest third in the nation. Very good. Uh, on our two-year schools, uh, not so good, not far off the national average, uh, but, but not below the national average. But as we look at our competitors, uh, we have to be extremely aware of what they're doing in South Dakota, Montana, Minnesota, other places. South Dakota is trying very hard to, to actually buy students. They really have they've dropped their tuition to a point where they are really trying to attract uh, students with low tuition. And I'm very proud uh, that even though they're below us, uh, they're not being successful uh, with the students who are looking at both North Dakota and South Dakota. We are getting those, uh, the same level of students in that pool as we have before, and our tuition is higher. That tells me that uh, our product has a good reputation. We also should look at bonus factors for performance, and this is the beauty of the new funding formula as well. It allows you to do that quite easily. Uh, how about every student graduating on schedule? Uh, getting 
uh, an extra tenth of a person. Uh, another good way to look at it would be each graduate in a targeted job category uh, that is staying in the student loan forgiveness program. Why not give an additional factor for each one of those out there? That's a reward to the campus for getting that student graduated, getting them landed in a high priority job in North Dakota. That would be a perfect alignment uh, of the formula uh, with our overall mission. Private sector, still incredibly important to us and something we need to keep working on all the time with an even greater focus on business needs. There's another survey going on right now that is much more focused, uh, being led by the Fargo Chamber. It's being uh, worked on uh, with uh, former Senator, State Senator Tony Grinberg, asking companies very directly in the Cass County area, or the whole Red River Valley for that matter, what exactly do you need uh, in the way of employees right now? Uh, not just a general category, but what specifically, what subset of training and education do they need? And this, this focus uh, can be increased. Uh, student loan forgiveness has been probably our best tool uh, in targeting high priority occupations. We actually want to communicate in freshman and sophomore year. If you choose this career path, uh, you can get $5,000 from the state of North Dakota against your student loans. That's, that's been a good tool. Why does that work better than lowering tuition? Because they have to stay in North Dakota. They have to take a job in North Dakota. And they have to keep that job each year for five years. That really puts your money in the right place, and it has worked extremely well. We can do much more with that. Uh, we have a large list. Uh, many of the opportunities uh, go, um, you know, uh, without people taking advantage of the opportunity uh, simply because they're not aware of how much uh, help they can get with their student loan repayment. There's also work being done on apprenticeships. This is a big topic unto itself. But apprenticeships is a national effort now because what's becoming important is going back for training, going back for more education. And apprenticeships means you have some experience, uh, but with the help of a um, higher, uh, institution of higher education, uh, you can work directly with a business to get more education. We're also following a path that is nationally inspired regarding credentials. Credentials is something that is a, an untapped opportunity. Many industries have, have done well with this in the past. Manufacturing's done a pretty good job, especially the auto industry. There are many, many certificates in that industry. The healthcare industry has done quite well. You have various kinds of uh, certificates for your jobs. But there are many other uh, industries where there is no credentialing, uh, so to speak. And we need to identify uh, some of those and encourage them uh, in North Dakota. You could become a certified something. And it has value in the workplace, but it also focuses your education mission as you go. Uh, and finally, uh, entirely new careers have got to be identified and supported. And uh, my favorite example is cybersecurity. Uh, how do you address that? Uh, you don't have people to help you get that launched right away, uh, but we know it's part of the future. Education partnerships are important. Um, please continue to expand your efforts in AP and dual credit. Uh, That's nothing but a win-win deal for all of us. Uh, please uh, support K-12's efforts uh, to leverage senior year. Senior year is probably our most or senior year in high school is probably the most wasted year of education uh, in, the, in the country, and uh, we really should do something about that. And I think uh, K-12 and higher ed working together uh, can, can solve that problem. Um, and I also want to mention REAs, Rural Education Associations, 
Uh, I think we have to uh, keep improving them and keep supporting them. They are important uh, for the opportunity for advanced courses in high school, uh, like math, science, foreign language, beyond the third year requirement. And those are things that can only come uh, if everybody gets behind it. Okay, since you're in charge of management, presidents and board members, I'm going to get out of my area and give you some worthless advice. Um, and I'm just doing this because this is my big chance. Um, continue to prioritize uh, what campuses do well. Uh, we know there is a difference. Some courses, some campuses do certain things incredibly well. And, and we need to uh, be aware of that. Avoid duplication where possible, obviously. Um, I think uh, you should look hard at sharing budget professionals and back office functions. We've been saying that for years. Um, but what we have envisioned is that one or two uh, universities would kind of lead the way and say, OK, uh, we're among the biggest, so we'll do it here. And we'll, we'll charge you a fee for this service. And uh, we had hoped that it would somehow come about, I think, all by itself. Well, it really hasn't. So I'm going to suggest that as a board, uh, you actually address this directly. How can you, as a board, as a system, uh, actually push campuses to share uh, people like budget professionals and, and many other back office functions? Uh, I, we, we know there are savings there. Uh, please utilize existing buildings more effectively. Uh, sometimes um, we see buildings that uh, don't look like they're doing much. Um, and in that vein, uh, I would strongly suggest uh, that you do an ongoing uh, space utilization analysis. In state government at OMB, we do a continuous appraisal of the use of square footage uh, what needs are growing, what needs are declining, uh, exactly how is the mix changing. We don't just stop and do a five-year study once in a while. We are constantly reevaluating uh, space utilization, and it works very well. And the last one, I'm sorry, I just can't help it. Uh, please maintain your buildings. Um, it's just good business. It's so easy to kick that can down the road to the next president, uh, but it, it really is a pride of ownership thing. Uh, if you spend some money every year, uh, you won't get in the place that you don't want to be, which is uh, too far behind. Quick word on financial support. This screen's too small for this slide, but... Um, Student financial support, critical piece. And we know that the DEAL program has been doing a great job out of the Bank of North Dakota, $990 million portfolio. Regular DEAL is 661 million, 10,336 borrowers. DEAL 1 is the refinance program that we have fairly recently initiated. Already up to 7,500 borrowers. $329 million worth of loan. And here's what we're trying to do. Our fixed rate is 4.46, but our best deal on deal one is a variable rate of 1.88%. And actually, uh, if you go along with a couple of their requirements, you can even get it uh, down close to 1.5. The beauty of this variable rate offering is that it's guaranteed not to increase by more than 1% per year. And what people, what borrowers worry about, of course, is not so much the rate as, you know, what happens if uh, a variable rate takes off on me and uh, suddenly I'm paying 10, uh, like the old days. And this protects you from that. So in a period of four years, you can pay down a lot on your student loan and know that you've gotten a great rate the entire the entire time. 
Federal rates have recently, uh, or are about to get better, which is also good news. Uh, and they will be down in that, you know, three to five range as well. But looking at the refinancing, uh, the Bank of North Dakota tells me that they refinanced uh, uh, loans as high as 14.25%. Uh, the average variable rate that they refinance from outside lenders is 7.03%. Coming off of 7.03, refinancing everything you've got at 1.88 or less. Typical federal rates that we consolidate into deal one uh, if it's not a subsidized loan, 7.9 and 8.5 are the rates. There is no greater thing uh, that we can do in dealing with student loan debt uh, than making it easier for people to service this debt and by a wide margin. The banks also got a great deal on babies that get bank accounts uh, when they're born uh, to help them pay for college and college save as you know uh, has been very successful uh, has doubled in the last uh, four years and this program allows every North Dakota taxpayer to deduct ten thousand dollars annually uh, from their joint return uh, as long as it goes into a college save program incredible incentive uh, for people to save for college and it's been been very very successful student financial report in general uh, financial support in general um, we provided more than a hundred million dollars in scholarships grants and loan forgiveness since 2007 it's a big 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 effort finally a few miscellaneous topics new buildings um, I, I knew that you would be wondering, so I just decided to put it on the slide. Um, first of all, the good news. We caught up a lot over the last 10 years uh, from where we were. We've built a med school. We've built STEM buildings. We've done incredible things on all the campuses. And, and that is, you know, going to mean a lot going forward. But truth of the matter is, uh, the state as a whole is not got cash reserves that we can now give you uh, to build a building. It, they're not there, So just so you know. So what do we do? Um, I put the word bonding on the sheet uh, just to remind you uh, that we used to use it a lot back in the old days. Um, Ed Schaefer would remember that was our main tool. Uh, we actually developed a mechanism based on the total amount of debt service that would be required uh, in a biennial period. Uh, and it allowed us to do some things that we felt were essential. But essential is really the right word. Um, I think uh, for the upcoming biennium, uh, this is really something that would only be discussed in uh, what I would call critical situations. Research dollars still incredibly important to our flagship universities. Centers of Excellence has been our main program for uh, dealing with this. It's been very successful, worked very well. At times, leverages state dollars 10 to 1 and has done some incredible things uh, for our state. And we also need to keep looking at endowed chairs in relation to research. One big name researcher recruited and subsidized into North Dakota can bring a reputation that brings a phenomenal amount of financial support with it. And I think it's something that we need to look at very systematically. So I'm going to close with this slide because I have talked so much about career education that I'm afraid that you now have the impression that's all I care about. And it's not true. Um, we, it's, we definitely spend, well, I put on the slide, 98%, not, maybe not quite 98%, but it seems like 98% of our time. Uh, we're talking about how to graduate these people that we need for our state economy and for our prosperity. And we forget 
to talk about what we have going on the liberal arts side of education. We actually have a phenomenal uh, program, and I would say that in our general, general education requirements, which is where our liberal arts really happens, nine out of our 12 courses are liberal arts. Uh, that's a strong emphasis. The other amazing thing is that our general education requirements are uniform uh, throughout our system. All 11 campuses do it the same. That has incredible value uh, when it comes to transferring, of course, from a two-year to a four-year school. Uh, but it also has incredible value in terms of knowing uh, what you're delivering statewide. This uniform system of liberal arts uh, delivery with a strong emphasis on liberal arts is, I believe, unique in the United States of America. We need to be proud of that. Uh, and it's very seldom uh, that I hear anyone brag about it. We need to be aware, however, that in the four, third and fourth year of a four-year program, uh, there is very little room for liberal arts. Most of the liberal arts uh, lands in a very concentrated way in freshman and sophomore year. Uh, that's something to discuss uh, because some some kids, maybe most kids, um, you know, are not uh, done making decisions about what they're interested in uh, at the end of sophomore year. They're still uh, changing their minds. And finally, liberal arts. What does it mean in the big picture? Uh, talking about economic development, social vitality, uh, these folks, these students, are the job creators uh, for the future of North Dakota. They need this type of education to be great citizens, great thinkers, and visionaries, the dreamers. Those, those people uh, need to be well-educated as well. Folks, thank you for giving me a shot at you. You know, gosh, I didn't, I'm sorry, like, I went past my time. I, like, I guess I must have had a lot of uh, things uh, pent up that I wanted to say to you. Um, but uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, Chancellor Hagerot, uh, I, I commend you for doing a envisioning exercise. I think it's, it's very important. Uh, we probably should do it more often. And uh, it, it does uh, bring us together. Uh, and help us to focus on what we're doing. Thank you very much. Governor Dalrymple, thank you so much. Your words were general and they were specific. And they actually give us our pivot point as we work today. So thank you very, very much for taking the time to join us. And you talked about a unified system. That is what we are here today, every day. We're a unified higher education system that works under the governance of the board, but we work together. And everyone in this room today is here because they have an interest in furthering that mission. Our next speaker is US Senator Heidi Heitkamp. Senator Heitkamp is the first female senator elected from North Dakota. And Senator Heitkamp, I would like to commend you in that regard. You are a trailblazer for us. I admire you, and I know that you have no one else to talk to when you are the first woman. Now, there are future young ladies who will be able to talk to you, but I admire you. Senator Heitkamp previously served as North Dakota's Attorney General and Tax Commissioner. In the U.S. Senator and Senate, Heid, Senator Heitkamp has been working on policies that will help build strong futures for North Dakotans, including making college more affordable, enabling students to refinance private student loans, and supporting early education through Head Start. She's also pushing to diversify and strengthen North Dakota's economy through investments in small businesses, UN, uh, UAS systems, cybersecurity, technology, and startups, and economic development. And she continues to seek out ways to support working families through the creation of a federal paid family and medical leave policy 
and resources to support job training and retraining. Please help me welcome Senator Heitkamp. That's very nice, thank you. It's good to see you. Thank you, and, and the main reason why I wanted to stop by is to tell you that as I've traveled around the state, I have darkened your door uh, many times, and I have been extraordinarily grateful um, for the hospitality um, that you've all shown me and for the interest that you all have in understanding federal programs and how we can work uh, together better. Um, but, I, but I will tell you this, um, I have been so proud of the work that the Bank of North Dakota has done on student loan refinancing. Um, as we fight that fight in a, in a more macro scale, um, you know, I'm proud to stand up and talk about this program and, in fact, plan a floor speech this week um, to talk about it because um, people think it can't happen. And that's one of the great lessons of North Dakota. Um, people say, what's the difference? I say, well, you know, when you're traveling around the country or, or working with my colleagues, if you have a good idea, you say, look, I think it, this could work. And they say, oh, that's a really good idea, but it'll never happen. I mean, there is a culture of failure that has not yet reached North Dakota. We don't have a culture of failure. We have a culture where we know that if we work together, if we work smart, if we um, uh, apply facts and not ideology, that we can achieve. And so the governor has just given you a, a pretty much in the weeds kind of presentation. And, and I think I'd like to think that maybe my thoughts today might complement um, uh, some of that because I'm not dealing with the funding formulas and I'm not dealing with um, all of the issues in terms of making sure your buildings are taken care of. You know, what I think we should be talking about today is what does the future look like? What does the future look like? Not just in North Dakota. Because, honest to God, you are not an island. You operate in a, in a global environment. And so I want to share just a couple, couple ideas that might spark some, um, some discussion today. And the first one I think might be fairly controversial. Higher education is not an institution. We spend a lot of time talking about institutions, don't we? Spent a lot of time talking about funding formulas, all of this, but higher education is not an institution. It is about the knowledge that is imparted post-secondary education to our citizens to make them better citizens, better prepared, better global citizens, and honestly, um, better prepared in the workforce. So as you think about this and as you get bogged down into a discussion about institutions, I think Kathy did it best when she said, we have to be student-centered. We have to be student-centered. And let me tell you, the future of higher education, I don't think, is necessarily in institutions. I don't think we can get rid of institutions altogether, but education is going to be delivered in a much bigger platform um, than it was when I was a student at uh, uh, UND. And so our future is global. Uh, people talk to me all the, all the time about trade agreements and about, you know, North Dakota's economy. And I will tell you, 95% of all consumers in the world do not live in this country. If we expect to be competitive, if we expect to be, um, you know, offering an opportunity that will keep kids here, that will create an economy here, we have to be global. And that creates a tremendous amount of insecurity talking about this. You see it at the, at the um, level of the presidential debate. Everyone's running away from thinking global. You can't run away from thinking global. We've got to think global. The, the, the second truth is the future is entrepreneurial. You are not training people for jobs. You can't train people for jobs. Because that dynamic, when I was a kid, that's not real anymore. That idea that you're going to spend 20 years, get a pension, 30 years, get a pension, and you're going to walk out of that job having progressed based on merit, maybe run the company someday. That's not the model. And that is not what kids expect today. They expect that they will be in an economy that will be dynamic, that they will be able to pick and choose their opportunities, and more importantly, the kids that I talk to 
want to create their own opportunities. And it's your job to prepare them to do that. So when we talk about, you, you talk a lot about kind of career development and what the business world needs, I'd suggest that maybe you should think a little bit about kids and what they could do given the right educational tools, given the right opportunity to really invent and create and think. You know, we, we have a little program. We've been trying to figure out how we can help in some small way because I think SBA is not prepared, not prepared for that new dynamic. You know, if it's not bricks and mortar, how do you, how do you finance it, Eric? It, it, you know, it, it, if it's all up here, how do you account for that? And so we're trying to figure out how we can adjust federal programs to really drill down into that innovative um, entrepreneurial spirit that I see in kids every day that come. And I probably spend more time. I, some of you are classroom teachers, and so I shouldn't say this, but I spend a tremendous amount of time in high schools across North Dakota. I spend a lot of time with close-up kids. I spend a lot of time talking to kids in North Dakota. And they are ready for this challenge. But are we ready for this challenge when we think about old institutions and old models? I think the future is more diverse, um, whether that is taking a look at being more welcoming um, as it relates to sexual orientation, whether that is, in fact, taking a look at um, uh, bias that we may have, if, if that is, in fact, um, uh, talking to Native American students who don't always feel welcome on the campuses as they transition. We've got to be more diverse because, honestly, that's where the population growth is and that's where the opportunity is. And understanding different cultures is part of what we need to be when we look at global. And so um, what about North Dakota? Uh, I tell everyone this because I spend a lot of time talking about North Dakota's economy. Um, people are always intrigued. North Dakota has some great numbers. You saw them. Um, those great numbers are driven by commodities, right? They're driven by, you know, what's the price of corn? What's the price of wheat? What's the price of oil? And how are we extracting it? Now, that's not to say that we're stuck in a rut because we've become more innovative in terms of how we extract oil. We're even getting more innovative, Kathy. I mean, I've got to go back to Oil 101 again to just find out what those new techniques are. And so we're innovative in terms of how we extract it, but the product that we extract is still traded on a global, um, on a global basis, and it is still commodity-driven. The, the, the uh, products that we grow from this incredible research that we've had at NDSU, this incredible uh, uh, farming techniques, whether it's high-tech or precision ag, we know we're doing it. We need to do better in terms of soil conservation, water conservation, because those are going to be challenges into the future. But we're pretty damn good at producing. But what we produce is still traded on a global market, and we are still um, not able to ne necessarily uh, uh, meet our destiny. We used to think that how we did that is we did value at it. And that has been tremendous, whether it's Dakota pasta, whether it is our sugar beet industry, We've done a pretty good jo job with value added, whether it's new refineries, adding value to the oil that we produce. But at the very heart of it, we cannot be slaves to the global commodities market if we're going to be successful into the future. And so we've got to think more innovative. We've got to think, and that's why, you know, this oil, I, I, I had, um, when I first came here um, uh, to the tax department, um, there was a guy named Ken Jakes, and in his drawer was the Iverson, a bottle of Iverson oil. I, I, I gave it away foolishly. Um, but, you know, if you looked at the, the techniques that were used to extract the Iverson oil compared to this oil, it's day and night, right? But you know what this is? 350 little pieces of nanotechnology. 350, you can't even see them, right? This is what we need to be focused on. This, I'm not abandoning our traditional resources, but what's our opportunity? What's our opportunity to um, focus on, on what is, uh, in fact, um, uh, going to be a huge part of the global economy? And so I want to um, give a couple shout outs um, to some of you um, uh, who I've met along the way, who I think have been innovators 
um, and you're all innovators. These are just um, projects that I've had the honor to see. Um, Larry Scogan, President Scogan, he's here somewhere. There he is. You know, when I first met with him, I said, aren't you afraid of what's happening in higher education with, uh, with distance learning and the competition? He said, no, I'm excited about it. And this is how we're embracing it. This is how we know we need to change here at our institution. That's great. Josh Wynn, we have huge problems in terms of delivery of healthcare workforce. Here's a place where we, we just have not, I mean, we, we have the potential of nursing homes shutting down in North Dakota because we don't have nurses or nurses assistants. We have hospitals where whole wings are shut down because we can't staff them. And into that void comes leadership from, N, uh, from UND and from the School of Medicine um, stepping up. Um, but we also know that a lot of young people, these same young people that I talk to, when I say, how many of you are going to be involved in health care? Maybe 2% raise their hand. I don't know. They don't really know what they're going to do out of fairness. But I went to a great um, meeting at uh, Lake Region where they brought in uh, North Dakota Extension, brought in all these students and showed them. You know, these were, these were what, fifth, sixth grade graders? And the high school kids who had done it came in, and, and they were making that happen and teaching them about... Uh, getting into the pipeline, getting into the pipeline so that they're ready when they come to your institution. But we have got to understand where those jobs are and how we're going to recruit a workforce in those jobs. Um, making, making the argument that healthcare delivery will change. Healthcare delivery will become more accountable. Healthcare delivery will become more specialized. Healthcare delivery will become, I think, um, uh, uh, more challenging in this world. And let me tell you what the real challenge is. It's going to break the budget. And so how do we innovate, be entrepreneurial in what we do where, where uh, Josh is, is creating this great building, great center of learning, taking a look at a new uh, team approach to delivery of healthcare? That's cutting edge stuff. And we're doing it right here in North Dakota, and so you should be extraordinarily proud. And then I look at um, integration with communities, and uh, Dr. Shirley over there, um, Minot, is doing a great job getting in, in uh, taking a look at what we need in Minot, taking a look at how we're going to deal with all of this, um, you know, all of this transition in terms of workforce. And so I want to kind of close with, um, I think, some challenges. And, and maybe set a, a set a different context here than uh, the last speaker, but I think it's an important context to to look above, and that's really I think why you're all here. Um, you know, you can look at what it costs, and you can talk about the institutional costs, but this is going to be driven by student costs, and higher education is too expensive. Why is that? Because we're all in competition, and because for years federal government slid a piece of paper across the desk and said sign on the dotted line and they gave them $100,000 to go to get an education and no one seemed to think that there should be a level of accountability. And so where, where I'm not someone who comes to you and says that the student loan program didn't, d doesn't share in some of this challenge, the challenge really is back on you on how to be um, uh, cost, cost conscious. Um, delivering a high quality product for a lower cost. There's a way to do it. We've always done it in North Dakota. Um, oh, reward achievers in the system is the second thing I would say. Uh, Dr. Shirley, you have a great PhD um, who every year wins the poster contest for Minot State. And, and you know, it, it's a, a source of proud, pride for me that your school does that. But the m most exciting thing for me is when I talk to these students his students that he, he researches with. And they sit down and they say, I never thought I'd be doing this work. And he's, he, you know, shouldn't he be rewarded? Shouldn't he be acknowledged and, and, and uh, recruited? I'm, I'm amazed you've been able to hang on to him. Because every year when he wins this, obviously, he's in a, he's in a national uh, competition and people see the great work that he does. So, um, uh, this might be controversial too. Don't ghettoize trades. You know, I, 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 
I get occasionally a letter from uh, parents because I talk about becoming a welder or a plumber or an electrician or, you know, getting, because that's part of higher education too. That's postgraduate education. And we somehow have convinced parents and kids that that kind of, um, that kind of uh, education doesn't have value. It has huge in value, tremendous importance to us. And so, so we, need to, we need to talk about all of this, not by layering it or putting it in tears, but just talking about how critical and how important it is that, that we provide opportunity to kids to do what they want to do. And I know a lot of kids would love that uh, work, um, but they've been told somehow they're a failure if they don't get that four-year degree. Um, the fourth thing I would say is pay attention to gender. I get in a little trouble when I talk about this too. Take a look at the trajectory of who's graduating from college. Who is it? It's women. You know, if those numbers were reversed, there'd be a march on Washington. Right? We're leaving boys behind. And I don't know if when, when that happens. I don't know when, when we've uh, uh, kind of failed to uh, do the outreach that we need to do. But just as I don't think that we should have, uh, you know, we should have institutions and organizations that reflect the membership, I think it is a very bad trend that we have now seen more women graduating from high, uh, high school and graduating from college than men, disproportionately high. The one number that I saw is three to two thirds in the next five years of all graduates will be women. That's not acceptable because there's a whole talent pool that there is not um, getting out there. The, the fifth thing I'll say is tribal colleges, tribal colleges, tribal colleges. Huge source of opportunity, huge source of, um, of uh, great students. You have some of the best higher education professionals running those institutions. We should be so proud of our tribal schools. And th we should be so proud of the caliber of, of uh, uh, leadership that we have in those schools. They need to be integrated in a way um, that offers those students uh, equal opportunity. Um, and finally, I'm gonna say that where you guys are all focused right now on higher education, a lot of the challenge in higher education is you're educating the kids you get. And we are, we are challenged in that we don't have kids ready to learn in higher education. That's why we're talking about remedial opportunities. I'm not saying take away remedial opportunities, but th those challenges, quite honestly, um, folks start at a very, very young age. And so the best bang for the buck, as we're looking at trying to prepare kids for um, college, is preparing kids to go to first grade. It's that early childhood education. I mean, shout out to Dickinson. Dickinson has a program where they coordinate their Head Start with uh, the school. And the person who uh, runs it is uh, Community Action. So it's, it's off to the side. When I talk to the school psychologist, who helps with that program, she said that over half of the kids that would have otherwise been Title I special education kids are not having gone through that Dickinson Head Start program. How much does that save you? And what's the ultimate achievement level for kids who actually are given that opportunity on the front end to get the kind of trauma treatment that they need, to get the kind of early start that they need in order to be successful? and then working with parents to make sure parents are engaged in their education. So just as you're looking at the, the end, whether we're gonna get doctors or whether we're gonna get lawyers or whether we're gonna get PhD uh, petroleum engineers, you know, that's all critical. But if you think about the funnel, you've gotta think about the top of the funnel because that's gonna determine the quality of what comes out the bottom. And that's also gonna create the workforce to opportunity. Tell you a story. I've been spending um, a lot of time going to rural communities because I kind of like going there. Those are kind of my people, uh, being from a town of 90 people. Um, but I, I did a series of meetings in Wahala, Cavalier, and uh, Grafton. 
and I went around and I met with the economic development folks, met around, uh, met with uh, entre local entrepreneurs and, and uh, um, uh, business people. In that region, there are 80 primary sector jobs. We had a theory back in the 90s that if you just created those primary sector jobs, everything would come along, right? We can't fill 80 jobs because we have not created communities that people want to live in. And so we can't segregate this, this um, uh, economic or jobs development from community development and community opportunities. And so having people who can serve in healthcare in those communities because whose mom is gonna be in the nursing home if the doctor is 150 miles away? I mean, having those communities um, have the, the pride of spirit and uh, know that they've got some folks on their side, absolutely critical. And so um, I wanna thank you all for letting me come just for Dr. Hagrid. It wasn't my fault that I went over. That was the governor. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, 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 I do hope that what comes out of this will be a list of things for Senator Hoven and me and uh, Congressman Kramer to work on. I hope that you will say, look, this is where the federal government's not being a good partner. This is where they are being a good partner. These are the research opportunities that we have. These are the things that we need to do, whether it's UAS, whether it's student loans. But, but I will tell you, the best way to approach your work today is think about the kids. Think about the students. And think about not creating the opportunity that you're gonna give them, but giving them the skill sets so they can tell you what opportunity they're gonna create for North Dakota. Thank you so much for letting me come. Senator, thank you so much. We appreciate your joining us and really appreciate your excitement that you bring to uh, the vision for higher education in this great state. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Hagerot, the Chancellor of the North Dakota University System. Before taking his job last July, Chancellor Hagerot held numerous leadership positions in the U.S. Navy. He served as Chief Engineer for a major environmental project and ran tactical data networks for the Navy, rising to ship command prior to his career in higher education. Hagerot served in Annapolis as the Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences, Chairmanship of Senior Faculty Senate, Chair of the Admissions Board. Um, he also served as a Planning and Strategy Director in one of the largest U.S. Army educational organizations the NATO training mission. Prior to his move back to North Dakota, Hagerot served as the senior civilian and deputy director of the Center of Cybersecurity Studies at the Naval Academy and on the Defense Science Board study of an unmanned systems. Aiden, you stay with us for just a couple more minutes here, okay? Good job, Guy. Um, please help me welcome Chancellor Hagerot. <laughs> Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, and uh, I'll accelerate this. Uh, and we did plan a little bit of uh, compression here. So um, so first, I just want to thank everybody uh, for coming. And uh, I'm going to have four tasks. Uh, one is some thank yous uh, to then also bridge the round table that the governor talked about and what your board has been doing on strategies. Frame a little bit of um, how to think about changing society, structures, technology, and what higher ed does. And then lastly, get you oriented uh, for the breakout sessions. Uh, and I just want to say first, you have a wonderful set of colleges, universities, the presidents, I call it the biggest distributed think tank in the country. But the task we're talking about here requires an even bigger brain trust, and that's the knowledge coming from the business community, our legislators, uh, the governor's staff, community leaders, and so this is just the beginning of a longer conversation uh, that will go on probably a year, year and a half with studies and uh, actual deliverables for you. So, um, so I want to thank people. And uh, let me then uh, give you a little bit of background uh, to bridge from what the governor was saying. If I can get this uh, to go here. 
Okay, so you have a wonderful system. I mean, and think of it as a system that uh, any one school alone can't compete with, let's say, Arizona State that has almost 80,000 students. But when you've got a system like this distributed across the state, we're getting into the 50,000 mark, you've got thousands of faculty and staff, billions of dollars of effect, and think of it as a massive learning, education, knowledge creation, knowledge transfer system for today, for 2030 and beyond, creating knowledge and helping our economy um, diversify. And so that's what you have there. And as the governor mentioned, it is nicely distributed because people, despite all the online technologies, people still live in a place. And architects call it power of place, identity. And uh, as, as I think Senator Heitkamp mentioned, if you've got a mother in a nursing home, maybe you want to go to school nearby. Uh, and those places are physical locations people can go, plus all the online technologies. So again, that's the system you have. Wonderful system distributed across the state. Uh, and you've got un overlaid here the cities, the air bases, things that are just an incredible uh, integration of people, communities, and knowledge creators. So how are you doing real quickly? In your packet has some of the stuff, but to let you know, in our state, we are doing well. We are a state that values education from way back at the beginning and you still see yourselves way up here, and we have goals for Lumina Foundation are here to go even higher, above 48% uh, of people having college education attaining degrees. Now, how are we doing? Uh, again, we want a frank conversation. In some areas, we're doing very, very well. The two-year campus is 62%, graduating within 150% of the time. Four-year schools, above average, but we want a frank conversation, not just a, you know the victory lap here. We want frank conversations about how we're doing. And in many ways, we're doing well, well above average. Others, not quite where we'd want to be. Now, how are we doing in tuition fees to complement the legislators who are here uh, and, and the managers of our campuses? As the governor said, our, you know, we've kept costs down. Uh, we got to do more. And we have, I'll show you, we have studies to adapt that. But tuition changes over the last several years, average 18% in the United States, minus 2%. Compliment to our two-year schools. These are people in this room working hard to maintain uh, a competitive cost structure. Um, same thing similarly here at the four-year campuses. Average United States raising tuition, putting on the backs of students. And again, not to say we, we, we can't do better, but again, uh, your system is trying to be responsive to that. All right. So research universities, the governor brought it up, Senator Heikam brought up, creating new knowledge. These are engines of the future. Um, and um, we haven't studied that yet. It's going to be on phase two. We'll get to the studies that we'll talk about. You have a strategy, a state board engaged, uh, and there's only so many things we can do uh, at once, but we are mindful to look hard at how are we doing to be the knowledge engines of the future, and that will come later. Okay, so the governor talked about roundtable. That happened about 15 years ago. In the interim, there has been strategic reviews and adaptations, and we have a strategy that was established in 2014, and we'll talk briefly about it, it really focuses on building collaboration with legislators, K-12 businesses, very focused outwardly. And interestingly, campus strategies align to that and are in review, and this is a very timely period to now get a longer term look. Intermediate strategy, ours go up to 2020, and this takes a longer view. So what is going on in our strategy? You actually have people who are metric driven, all right? This state board is very metric driven, and you can find this online, every campus, statistics, more statistics you can imagine. I'm doing presidential evals. I have a binder this thick of the presidents. What are their goals? What are the objectives? What are their metrics? We are moving further and further to metric driven so we can tell you what you're getting for your money. All right? And we have it online to make it even easier. So strategies in place, adapting, and with metrics. So the strategy is long. I have a little maritime memory device for you because I had to get this down. But think of C squared the word C. We want a superior system, not just an average system. Okay, there's a book out now about the rise of the cities. Minneapolis is an entity of its own. Minneapolis, New York, we as a state, each city can't compete against like, but if we work as a system, a superior system, education, community, knowledge, collaboration, we can do incredible things, especially as Andy Peterson, where are you Andy? Andy Peterson in here, he's gonna be on a panel shortly. Uh, with automation and maintenance technology, there's no disadvantage being a small state as long as it works as a system. We want to be excellent, though, not just okay, right? People know who gets a patent isn't just the okay patent submission. It's the best and the earliest patent submission 
and the knowledge we want to be excellent. And we are doing that in many categories. Top ranked nursing program in the entire country. My daughter's a nurse back east and she's dead. Dad, we were talking about this. What's going on out there? I said, well, that's why I need to move back, okay? Incredible, incredible performance, all right? Uh, and then accessible and affordable. If, if kids can't afford to go there, if they can't get there, they might as well not be there, okay? And so accessible, affordable. And these are the key pillars of our strategy that is in place right now. And there's some things uh, with, uh, with the round table that, that have shifted a little bit, and those can be other discussions, but generally aligns very closely. Some things uh, have, have evolved a little bit, but that's partly the exercise here to talk about where they should go in the future. Okay, so we have a strategy, but as anybody who knows, runs a company, you just can't say, hey, we have a strategy, we'll wait. We are constantly adapting to changing conditions. We have an incredible cabinet. These are led by the presidents. Six studies, there could have been more, but I'm mindful they've got to run their schools too. We're studying governance, also working with the legislature on that. We are studying a tuition model. We had a more uh, one-size-fits-all tuition model that was maybe going to go in, and the presence and the community said, we need to look at this more carefully. This is led by John Richmond, so we're looking to be adaptable to unique segmented conditions across our state, big state. The world's different in Williston than it is in Wapaton. Mission review, Larry Scogan's leading that. He'll be on a panel that's focused on two-year schools that will eventually become the research universities, research, and the four years. But while we're doing the mission review, Ms. Baszler here came to us and said, we have a crisis in teachers. What can you do? And in a matter of months, we turned this around, and this is a master's in teaching, was added. The other things we're doing, Ms. Baszler, who's been an incredible partner, we're working on dual credit, we're issuing the remedial issue, and also, if anybody followed, the federal government is giving a billion dollars for computer science education. We'll get into this, but the world is changing. Intelligent machines are rapidly proliferating. Who can understand these? Who can program them? For you, Aiden, you want to program that unmanned aircraft of the future. Um, and so we're working with them on that. So great partnership there. Shared services. Uh, I didn't compare notes with the governor ahead of time. He did his brief, but we are relentlessly moving on this, and that's Steve Shirley to find those efficiencies, uh, often back them up, operations. Similarly, administrative cost study. My staff is leading that, trying to find where we can find administrative cost savings. All the campuses are working on that now with a renewed urgency. And, and just a thought for you on that. We know budgets are tight. People talk about budgets a lot. We're trying to look out to the future. But if things would come out of today's session even, just be aware all this stuff is being fed back into the state board offsite in June. So if there's some urgent things that you say, you know, before anything, you make sure this happens or doesn't happen, uh, it will be incorporated because we are mindful the budget is a significant factor right now. And lastly, with Gary Hagan, we're working on retention, retention, attrition, and attainment. Hugely important. Every child should succeed. Right? I come from a tradition of the Naval Academy where retention and attrition are the top top priorities and uh, every student matters and uh, and that's how we want this every student who comes in matters and find a way forward and Gary Hagan's leading that uh, shared services Steve Shirley Larry Scogan mission John Richmond and I forgot to mention Tisa Mason uh, helping the governance study and Mike Ness from the state board uh, of course the bottom picture there is Bach and you we also are mindful that a major event happened in labor markets and in a matter of 10 days with Richard Arathas and Galen Baker are you here I thought I saw him walk in, Galen, there he is. He said, something's happening. Are you guys going to do something? And the normal attitude went, well, we'll get it next year. And instead, within 10 days, we rolled out a portal. Uh, we started advertising to students. And uh, we now have scholarships from the Hess Corporation, the Petroleum Council, and each of the Western five universities have scholarships. And, um, and we're just reaching out. Phase three is going to be curricular. And, and I'll kind of pre-announce, but we're going to be shifting this out of out of this Bismarck to the experts up in Williston and Minot working over that. that they're, the, they're closest to the oil patch and they'll be taking a leadership role in that. Uh, hugely important. All right. The other thing we're doing, and again, I didn't coordinate with, with the governor, uh, is that our leaders in our state have been way ahead. Unmanned systems, big data, the legislator talked about that, and then cybersecurity, the governor's task force. When we saw all the things that are going on in technology, our system came together and established three teams working on this. Ken Nygaard, are you here, Ken? I know you're going to try to drive out. The father of computer science. Uh, by the way, Ms. Baszler, are you here? Ms. Baszler here? I thought she, okay. Ms. Baszler and Ken Nygaard should meet each other because Ken is leading the initiative on cybersecurity. He has produced the leaders at UND, the leaders at Minot. By the way, Minot will be the second tier for cybersecurity. NDSU will lead the overall effort. 
Minot will be the four-year school. Paul Laurie at Minot just won the most competitive competition in Europe, beat Harvard, Yale, Cambridge, Oxford, and he's at Minot uh, doing great work. And then Bismarck State is going to become the, the main lead for two-year cybersecurity education across the state. And uh, the general from the National Guard, you here, sir? I saw the general. You can't miss him. Our National Guard has now been made a cyber protection team for the upper Midwest. All right, this is how severe it's getting, and he has a labor shortage we're going to try to help respond to. Unmanned systems, state, with the leadership of lieutenant, governor, and others, we are leading the world on that, but we now need to move into research. Hesham El Warini, are you here? Okay, Hesham, UND, is leading that effort. Unmanned systems, the world will not be the same, and North Dakota is on the lead on that. And then big data, uh, governor alluded to several new things, but this is changing the world. Uh, Microsoft is just down the road. They can tell you this in spades, what's going on. We have a nexus of universities, teams working together to look at the future. Okay, so that's stuff we're doing. We have a strategy, it's adapting, but, but that's an intermediate strategy. How might you look at what we're doing as a system and look at the future. So here's a way to think about this. Colleges and, quite frankly, many of your companies need to do three things to survive and flourish over time, okay? Three levels of what I call adaptation. Different people call it different things. There's a famous guy named Thomas Kuhn who used paradigms, uh, Robert K. Merton, social change and structures, but I make it simple. Three levels. We have to do three levels, and one is really, really hard. And that's probably where we're here, especially is number three. So what are the things we got to do? One is every day, your teachers, your faculty do a profound thing. They basically pass knowledge to the next generation, including adult learners, okay? They teach students how to learn how to learn, like what Senator Heitkamp said. They have to become learning machines. Aiden, you have to become a learning machine, okay? You have to keep learning, adapting, learning, and then convey this knowledge. This is a profound thing. It happens day to day, okay? And that's what our faculty are doing, our teachers, okay? Think of adjuncts probably doing this. They don't have a lot of authority to change curriculum. They come in, they help the professors. But then at level two, what I call tactical change, the department chairs, the uh, senior professors, they then say, hmm, what's happening to knowledge? And they change the knowledge. They change the curriculum. Many of the academics here know there's sometimes no bigger fights than over the curriculum, right? What's going into it? And this includes liberal arts. This includes technology, okay? Then sometimes they look at local changes of demand. Population's aging, we need more nurses, we need to adapt to that. So we got to do level one, we got to do level two. Those things usually aren't too controversial, they can be. But then you have level three. This is where entirely new possibilities emerge. And the governor alluded to them, Senator Heitkamp very bluntly alluded to them. Whole new profound change happens. Think of some of these. At one point, President Lincoln said, it's not enough we have Harvard and Yale. Every state needs to have this, and we're going to help this happen. In the middle of the Civil War, Battle of Bull Run, I mean, the government was about to fall. Think about it, the government was about to fall if they would have lost at Antietam, and he's thinking of the future of education. <sighs> Amazing. That became the foundation for NDSU. And if anybody knows what A&M means, agriculture and mechanical arts. It was the machines are coming, but we gotta feed people. Then our own state, early on, where we're still just barely, you know, getting the plow in the ground and stabilizing thing, the railroad has stopped at the Missouri River, bankruptcy, the, the panic, of of those years, 1873 was devastating. And what are they doing? They're establishing universities, thinking ahead. Now, unfortunately, the Hagarods came here, and we got the prison Bismarck. So you know, some people didn't quite have uh, the vision. Uh, but, uh, but thankfully, the people in the East uh, saw it first. Medical school, 20th century, the tribal colleges. Huge breakthrough. Tribal leaders saying in the 1970s, we need to do something different. It wasn't enough just to you know, paint buildings, but actually build entirely new buildings. Okay, And that's that level three. But this level three also often involves technology. Massive epic events happening in technology over time. And I would argue technology is one of the major drivers of our time. Radio, aerospace, computers. But before we get too detached, I want to tell just a brief story about this. Aiden, do you know what this is? Okay. Any of the older timers know what this is? Vacuum tube, very good. Okay, I want to bring it down a little more personal. And uh, I know Dean heard this story. So Dean, can you bear with me one more time on this one? I, he invited me out to the, uh, the uh, Chambers event. These inventions that came with radio and television changed my family's life. My family were farmers, but small farmers. And my grandfather desperately wanted my dad to stay on the farm. But they had eight mouths to feed. And after a harvest, and he made 150 bucks, it was like, pops, it's not working. But between courses he took at BJC 
his time in the Navy, a guy in the Mandan electronic shop, they said, this is wealth. This flashing light will be money and information. Now, Thomas Kuhn calls this incommensurable because my grandfather was born in the 1890s. Like, what the F are you talking about, okay? The Navy, we might say that word, but for emphasis. And my grandfather worked many summers with him. Um, Love farming was an incredibly innovative farmer, but this was the beginning of a new age. And so my father, building on this, had to follow the vacuum tube because we didn't have the jobs here. My brother, my mom, and my mom was pregnant. We went wherever the vacuum tube was. Uh, he went to the Arctic Circle. We moved back to Mandan. My mother raised us as a single mother, basically, but with every cousin and grandpa and grandma, there was lots of support. But this got him back on his feet, and about 10 years later, he was able to buy into the family farm, his dream. But it was on something that was incommensurable, a new technology. Now, the other point to make is that, partly why we're here, is it wasn't like he could just stop living, right? Children were coming, families were developing. If the professor at BJC hadn't been there at the time, if uh, the Mandan Electronics guy hadn't taken interest at that time, my dad would have been in the 19, 20, 21 and moved on, but they came just in time to build this new life. So the point is, now the bottom line, it's happening again. Robotics, artificial intelligence, big data, these epic events are happening now, and much like this point where the older generation is like, what are you talking about? We need to listen to the young people, we need to listen to business people, the professors, and visionary older people, because those who know the history of science, the man who changed the world, Copernicus, was in his last days of his life when he published his theory of how the world worked. So for the older people with imagination, uh, and not that some of the members of my board are older, but we have some incredible people on our new NDS Foundation who have been business people, and your imagination is welcome, even if you are over 50, Mike. You over 50 yet, Mike? Okay, all right, all right. So uh, it's happening again. And so what might be helpful to you, again, thinking about going off? And so when you're in these panels, you're breaking out, thinking about what has to change, uh, and think about big things. You know, big things are welcome. But here's a thought for you. The workforce is the source of innovation and wealth, okay? Um, the world is made of three things, energy, matter, and information. Our state has so much matter. It's got these open fields. It's producing this food, it, leading the world in eight categories, perhaps. We are now the second largest oil producer, wind energy, coal. We got those down. But information, it, there's books, it's like a mystery of what is information, really. But the point is humans create information, knowledge. And so you have this wonderful workforce, these students, and these universities. The second thing, because of the digital age, because the Internet's come together, that information's worth even more now. Think if you had to put it in a wagon and export it. The information transportation costs would be enormous, but now it can go like that. Your patents can become used around the world. And so last point, though, is to put some urgency behind this, is there is a problem with waiting. All right, There's whole theories about technology and early movers. The business people know this. But it, if you just need a reminder every now and then, just look at the keyboard on your computer, your handheld, and you'll see the top keys are Q-W-E-R-T-Y. Does anybody know? when that pattern the keyboard locked in. Anybody know? When did it? Get a typewriter in the 1860s. It is a suboptimal arrangement, but it locked in. We still use it. It also locks in Silicon Valley. They convinced Hewlett and Packard not to move back east. They were about the size of Fargo Grand Forks combined in 1958, and now they're about the, I don't know, top economy in the world. We should think big, but we have to also move fairly quickly. And so the last slide here is that we are a collaborative system. We are working together. We're trying to diversify the economy, help young people. How do you envision that future in your panels? And then lastly, just a reminder of those are the panels, and Don will introduce that later. And uh, liberal arts is hugely important. I didn't want to, I don't have time to get into it, but anybody just looks at the paper, the sense of citizenship is in turmoil. There's even a concept about what happens when you have a society's changes fast. So well, I see Catherine Rand is here. I mean, law is on the cutting edge. Privacy, what does that mean? So this is about liberal arts. It's about technology, but it's about the student, the whole student, the classroom. And we just thank for being part of that. And if we have an overflow, I just put this on here. In case the rooms are full, we will find a place for you to that breakthrough a breakout session. Okay. And with that, I'm about two minutes late. Is that right? Did I catch up almost? All right. So at this we go into a break, right? I'm three minutes late, so uh, thank you so much.
Thank you. Find your seats, please. Thank you. Thank you. This is not a very coachable group. Couple reminders, uh, if you're using social media, hashtag Envision, hashtag en Envision. Also, there's stacks of paper. Please pass those stacks of paper down, down the aisle. Uh, thank you to our governor, our senator, um, our chancellor, and our chairperson uh, getting us off to a great start. We're gonna shift gears now a little bit. And it's my pleasure to um, introduce Mark Sanford. Mark Sanford is a, um, North, was elected the North Dakota State Representative and uh, former all, former superintendent of Grand Forks. He led uh, he kept the school system afloat during the 1997 flood. That was a, a great job, Mark. And uh, he was also superintendent of the year that year. He's very um, He's been in the House of Representatives since 2011. He currently chairs the Interim Committee on Higher Ed. It's refreshing to walk in and see a very thoughtful um, person uh, in leading that group, and we appreciate it very much. Um, Representative Mark Sanford. Well, first of all, uh, there were handouts at your table. It, I apologize, but it's a legislative thing. You just have to have those handouts. When the, when the uh, fifth grader was uh, speaking this morning, it reminded me of uh, going back to my days in the school district where I always got to follow outstanding students and their sp speeches, and I thought, not again, because <laughs> they're really tough to compete with those wonderful kids, but it was a good thought, Kathy, and, a, and a, he did a really a wonderful job. 
Well, last fall, I had the opportunity to join the board of a new foundation. Uh, Dr. Michael Emmerich, in his will, directed that his assets be used to be put in a trust and that trust investment returns be used to provide scholarships for students who graduate from Carrington High School, his hometown, Grand Forks, or East Grand Forks, where he did all of his business. He was a founder of the Valley Vision Clinic. So we have been busy trying to get organized. This is our first round of grants. And in the last two weeks, I have been honored to distribute a couple dozen of those. We'll continue doing this through June 2nd. And when we end up, we will have 30 scholarships, full ride, $16,500 scholarships that will be going out there, minus whatever other grants and, uh, that they may have received. So those, it's a needs-based. <laughs> I call it a vision doctor with a vision, and uh, it's a great one. It's, it's needs-based. Every one of these recipients has a real story, and they are very unique and uh, very emotional, most of the meetings that we've been having. The, I can tell you, though, that the big thing that is consistent is the fact that they know the pathway to their future is through higher ed, and they are uh, looking forward to be becoming members, student body here in one of the many of the institutions in, in North Dakota. First one I gave was a young lady who happens to want to be an elementary teacher, and I said, this is great, that, given my background. Between, uh, between legislative sessions, the legislature organizes itself in study committees. There's about 13 of them. Um, so, uh, each of those committees is given a study list, and that's what I want to visit with you about today is some of the things that we have been looking at in the Higher Education Interim Committee. I think my comments today, to classify them, I'm going to say this is blocking and tackling, Coach Morton, uh, kind of stuff. Uh, it's the kind of stuff that I believe, if it's done well, you have all of the resources and, uh, that you need to do the things that we've been talking about today probably the most fundamental stuff. You do this first, everything else uh, follows. So if you would take a look at the handout, and on the uh, second page, I believe, there is a list of the studies that we have been working on. And I wanna go directly right to the first one, the higher ed governance. There's gonna be some crossover here with what the governor said, and there's gonna be a little bit of uh, different take on some of the things that uh, he might have said. So what we have uh, in North Dakota, we have these 11 institutions. They have one board. It's called a Consolidated Governing Board. 22 other states utilize this system of governance. So what we have done with the Legislative Study Committee is we have looked at the history of the North Dakota Board of Higher Education, not the system, the board, and how they govern. And secondly, we have looked at best practices. And we've had a couple of uh, former chancellors in three different states who've been working with us on this. So when we looked at the history, the history is not smooth. Uh, it is one of cycles where the board kind of has things working and then things go south. And then it gets working, and the cycle has about a three-year run up and down. So the uh, controversy we've had in recent years is not new. It's not unusual. It's pretty consistent over the history of the board. So what are the issues in the history that create this kind of cyclical pattern of governance? The first thing is the board not sure about what its goals are, what its agenda is. The third thing, the second thing that we found was that there is 
a big question of who's on first, kind of the Abbott and Costello stuff. When it comes to the administrative assignments and the relationship between specifically chancellor and presidents. And the third thing that is pretty consistent in this history of, of the, the Board of Higher Ed is that monitoring has not been a religion. Uh, it, it's kind of been a up and down thing, just like the history that I, that I described. So what the research suggests, or the literature suggested on its best practices, first thing would be take a look at your constitutional job description. And if you look on this page on governance, the bottom half is the job description for the Board of Higher Education. And it talks about, as the governor mentioned, that we have a system. Um, and it talks about the authority of the board to literally modify missions. This could be an important piece of where we at where we are at today in terms of program delivery and this type of thing. So it's not cast in stone that because I've done this, I'm going to do this forever. There may be a better way to do it, maybe a better way to deliver it. And the uh, second piece that uh, we have found, and, and of course, and this is all kind of basic stuff, but clarifying these leadership roles is just critical. I mean, in all candor, the last decade, most of this has been about who's on first in this relationship. That needs to be clarified. And uh, the third piece, of course, would be just the monitoring that I mentioned earlier. So um, we've produced a little paper, and that will be emailed to the board members today. Maybe they already have received it. I don't know. Uh, Legislative Council is responsible for that. Uh, so let's go then to the next study, institution missions. Later on, Dr. Skogan will, on the panel, will talk about the mission survey results. So I'm not going to spend much time on this particular issue or this particular page. I think the key finding, obviously, is the collaboration piece. And I want to tell you that we've been, uh, as we've been having our meetings on the campuses, we've had each of the campuses kind of tell us their story. And there are a number of good pieces of collaboration that are going on in this system, an impressive number. And the beauty of them is that I think every one of them results in these strong programs that we talk about. So this is a, uh, it's, it's a, when we looked at this institution missions thing, I think as a committee, one of the things we come away from uh, is that we're feeling pretty good about the way people are collaborating. And uh, Dr. Scoglin will give you more detail on that when he uh, covers the survey later on. Third piece, higher ed funding. And I do give the governor credit for his uh, leadership on the new funding model that we have. We've gone from a enrollment-based to a production-based uh, formula, and uh, some minor adjustments have been made legislatively, but most of this goes back to the governor and the finance officers from the higher ed system that put together this model that we do have. The question that I want to visit with you on today is how do we compare? So if you go to the page called Funding, pa funding Changes Over the Past 15 Years, you look at this particular uh, table, the top one, a little bit challenging on the eyes, but I can still see it, so everybody in the room should be able to then. Uh, if you look at 1999, the tuition, North Dakota's, was $3,053. That pushed, placed us 39th in the country in terms of what we were charging students on an FTE basis. Obviously behind the average, then you go to the appropriations column, and we were 45th in the country with $6,294 appropriation per FTE. And when you got to the total, we were 49th. So we, at that point in time, had a higher ed system that was being challenged. 
financially. So one of the things that happened is a over-reliance on tuition. So if you go further down the tuition column, you see what happens that 10 years down the road, we went from 39th to 15th in the amount of tuition students were paying. And today we're pretty close there in the, to in the top 20. The thing that's happened, of course, when we've had resources come to our state is the appropriation level has increased. So if you look at the appropriation column, you can see we went from 45th and we kind of stayed there for a significant amount of time. But in the last five to 10 years, we are now up to eighth in the country in terms of appropriation level. When you put those two together, 20th in tuition, eighth in appropriations, you can see on the table that we, in 2014, were 12th in the country then in total operating revenue per FTE. So what this tells me is just simply this, we're competitive. And it was not always the case. So we are, even though we have some issues coming facing us, we're starting from a competitive position rather than from 49th as we were 15 years ago. So revenue-wise, we're in pretty good shape. What about expenditures? Next table, or the next page, next couple of pages, deal with personnel and administrative costs. Um, this comes about, I'm sure, the legislative committee that decided we were going to do these studies and, and they uh, signed them out to us, comes from the national data, national stories on the perceived growth in administrative personnel in higher ed. Uh, so what I want to do is take a look at that national piece and then compare it to our North Dakota piece at a fairly high level, a level that will need more drilling down before you get really the kind of uh, information that, that we need. Um, on the uh, page called, uh, uh, it's got definitions on it. On the right-hand column, there's a definition of professional support. When you look at that definition of professional personnel, that's the one that's gained, so to speak, significantly in higher ed uh, pers personnel. Uh, so when you look at it, you can see it's quite a range. Now let's go to the next table and we'll try and summarize some of these things uh, on the national level. So on these costs for personnel and administrative, you can see that the first three components of the bar graph deal with instructional personnel. There's full-time faculty, there's part-time, there's instructors. The fourth one in, is administrative, traditional administrative positions. So as you look at this, take a look at the, 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 the first pair of bar graphs there is the public research institutions. This would be the UND and DSU. Administrative positions there on a national basis are essentially flat, 4%, 4%. Take a look then at the public master's programs, same thing, traditional administrative positions Every one of these levels, the traditional administrative positions, are essentially flat. Look at the professional levels, and you can see that they have grown. Some of them are brand new in this time, recent time frame. And the other thing that's grown is part-time faculty and instructors. So what's gone down? Decrease has come in full-time faculty, pretty significant, and also in non-professionals. So that's a snapshot at, the, at what's happened across the country. So if you go to the next page and you look at North Dakota data, here's issue number one. And I don't know if this is a board issue, probably better for the board than legislators to get their hands in this, but, but issue number one here 
is uh, going to be if you take this national data and you take the first three sections, go to the 2012 bar. Take the first three sections. So in the public research, these are the instructional positions. So there's a 20%, a 7%, and a 20%. Everybody with me? Okay, on the bar graph. We're going to do the national one, and we're going to come back to the next page and compare it with the, with the uh, North Dakota numbers. So if you look at these first three sections of the bar graph from the left, those are instructional positions. The first level, the first 20% there in 2012, up on the public research, that would be full-time faculty. 7% would be part-time faculty. 20% would be instructors. Okay? When you add those together, you get what? 47%. Okay, if you do the same thing with each of the other th three levels of institutions, you are going to see that the instructional total ranges from 47% to 58% at a national level. So the question then is, how do we compare in North Dakota when we look at our personnel costs, the biggest expenditure item in our budget. So on this page, the next page then, that has got the instructional employees and the non-instructional employees for North Dakota. Just go to the year 2012. And in 2012, there were 2,785 instructional. Right down below, in the non-instructional table, there's 6,104. Now, I did teach math, uh, and I know that that's not very close to 47 to 58. Now, there's got to be a reason for that. And so issue number one is digging down to find out what is the big difference in North Dakota versus national when it comes to these positions. Um, could be just classification. One of the things we found is we do not have a very good, consistent classification system to be able to even monitor uh, personnel, the biggest line item in the budget. So that may be the answer or part of the answer. But anyway, issue number one, professional versus non-professional staff. So then if you go to the next table, which has total university employees and university system student enrollment. And if you look at these, take from 2007, almost 8,000 in terms of employees, and in 2014, about 2,100 and um, 2,400, well, let's see. Yeah, about 1,200, 1,200 more. Enrollment goes from 35,000 up to 38,000. So what you have is about a Three to one, three new students equals one, one employee. Um, and so issue number two is, uh, what's, how does our personnel growth compare to enrollment growth? So all we're suggesting as a committee, legislatively, is that this is a big part of the budgets. This is a huge part of affordability. This is a significant issue when it comes to controlling costs going forward. And, uh, and so somehow we have to get to a deeper level, we have to get a better handle on what this means for this important uh, cost component 
of our uh, higher ed funding. Another area of higher ed funding that the uh, <clears throat> governor talked about, I liked his admonishment, take care of them, you know, those facilities. So we'll go, we'll go to the next one, expenditure area two, which is his facilities. And uh, the, the board received a uh, report on this at the last meeting, I believe, maybe earlier than that. But the legislature approved a million dollars here a couple of sessions ago for the purpose of developing facility master plans, specifically space utilization deep, uh, deep in, in terms of, of in the information. And so it's taken some time to gather that data. Uh, you know, we imagined that it was going to happen in six months, and then you start dealing with all of this space and so on, and it, and it didn't. But uh, to the board's credit and to the staff's credit, they've kept after it. Uh, everybody has cooperated on this, and we now have a report, and nobody is surprised uh, by the result. So this is not something that people w were not aware of. If you take and give a high-level summary, essentially what we have is excess space. And the second part of it is we have uh, significant deferred maintenance. Uh, and as the governor was saying, uh, it didn't get to be deferred by action. Uh, it was by inaction that it, uh, that it made it to that level. And the third piece that we have is that classroom and lab utilization rates are uh, significantly below target. Now, so here you have a board that is relatively new. I think Kathy's the only one that's been on the board since I started in the legislature. So what, five years? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, Don too, yeah. So it's, it's a, a new board, but it is what it is. I mean, this is the circumstance that you have today. And um, so it's, uh, one of the things is here is how to handle the space. And certainly with the trends in terms of delivery models, this becomes even, even a more interesting kind of struggle for the board and for everybody involved in higher ed on how to manage that. Um, I did see that some of the recommendations include uh, removing older facilities with high levels of deferred maintenance. And the board, to its credit, at the last meeting, uh, accepted a new policy that defined when you will be able to take down a building. And hats off. That's, I, my sense is that it's more challenging for this to happen at the local level. But now with the board policy, I think that simplifies it. Uh, they're also talking about centralized scheduling and uh, the ability to just concentrate the maintenance dollars in the classrooms and labs. So the final study that we did then is, of course, the, the course delivery one, and that's the next piece there. And uh, we're still not complete, not done with this, but there's two components that I want to just share with you today. One is textbook costs. Uh, national studies indicate that this is about $1,200 a year for a student. And uh, so one of the things we did was, uh, and, and when you look at this First slide, <clears throat> slide on uh, textbook cost. The alarming piece here, of course, is the number of students who are not buying books, taking fewer courses. It has an impact. It's the one, one of the areas that they can control. They don't set tuition. They decide if they're going to buy a book or not. So the open resource option was one that uh, was brought to our last legislative session by the higher ed folks. We provided a modest, very modest, amount of money for higher ed to look at this and it's a real uh, wonderful success story I think uh, we provided all of hundred and twenty thousand dollars they went wild and spent 40 and uh, the result in this first year <clears throat> is that if you look at this uh, the OER project this particular table North Dakota now has access to the University of Minnesota Open Textbook Network and Library. And that's one that has been vetted. It is recognized as a high quality uh, uh, system. 
And so obviously you don't go and say you have to do this. So what the higher ed folks have done is just introduce this to the, as uh, to more faculty members, their team leaders on each of the campuses. And uh, we received a report on the results at our last meeting. Um, so the pilot places essentially have been Valley City, Mayville, and the University of North Dakota. And uh, so in this first year, at this point in time, the savings to students because of textbooks now being open resources is over a million dollars. And uh, so some of the stories we heard this last time, a wonderful presentation from Valley City at the University of North Dakota, calculus. Calculus was hard for me in the, uh, with the book in front of me, but uh, the calculus professors are saying it's way better to be able to pick and choose uh, what you want to do there. Uh, so calculus has been a real success story for them. Um, also looking at uh, a law professor who was on a video that said, it's great, this is a live day-to-day uh, -day kind of course work that I have, material that I have, and I have access to this. And then it was interesting to see there was this uh, president of the University of North Dakota who teaches a leadership class between NDSU and UND, and he was espousing how his materials were so good because he was using open resources. So it was a wonderful uh, example of the ingenuity that's going on at, at, in higher ed and uh, how they are looking at this. So if you go then to the next table after that, it's kind of a composite report of the university distance education enrollment. And the third column from the right, 45.9% of our headcount is now involved in some level of distance education. The next table, or next slide, two important pieces there, uh, the, the second and the third bullet. 69% of all university system students taking at least one distance course are North Dakota residents. And the next one, 61% of all university students who are taking only distance ed are North Dakota residents. I can tell you that in the legislature, this totally flies in the face of the stereotype because I think the legislators, for the most part, believe that distance learning that you're working with somebody in Shanghai and how are they ever gonna come back here? So this is a beautiful affirmation of, again, some of the things that are going on in, in the university system. The next table simply has for you, it breaks it down, how they're doing it, uh, how much of it is involved, I should say, in the community colleges, regional universities, and the research institutions. Um, pretty amazing at the, at the uh, community colleges when half of the students are distance ed exclusively. So on the, la the uh, last slide, <clears throat> the thing that I wanted to add there is just simply, we also invested in a couple of pieces uh, that aren't course delivery methods, but they involve technology, and I wanted to just mention them. Uh, we were asked to put some money into predictive analytics and into intrusive counseling. And, uh, you know, both of those were big words for me, and I had to go have the serious explanation of what it was. But um, point being, we did uh, Valley City, Minot State, UND have been involved with the predictive analytics and the uh, intrusive counseling with the idea being this is significant in the way, in an effort to retain and to get pe people to completion sooner. And I can tell you that at the University of North Dakota, the first year as a pilot, the retention levels were increased somewhere in the vicinity of six, seven percent in, in that first year. So again, point of all this is uh, when I started, I went through some stuff that's pretty basic. Govern, the resources are adequate, we've got to watch our expenditures, Sounds pretty legislative-like, doesn't it? 
but there's also just a wonderful array of good things that are uh, happening uh, that really do uh, impress legislators and reaffirm the uh, use of the resources that are appropriated. So I want to just mention a bunch of them in a hurry, and then I will stop. Room and board affordability. I mean, when you can spend two to four thousand dollars less as a student in higher ed for room and board, this is a good deal. The research efforts. Last week we had a meeting, and the the uh, energy committee met in Grand Forks, and uh, we had reports from the research being done in energy. Tremendous. Our committee, the higher ed committee, met at NDSU earlier where we had a joint meeting with the Board of Higher Ed, which was a good experience for us. But part of our meeting was looking at the research at NDSU. Again, wonderful stories. Thank you, Dr. Rush, for sharing with us at, at that meeting. Results on occupational licensing exams. We have 160 programs, 160 degrees or certifications, and I say it this way, if they complete, they compete, because the completers that come out and take those occupational exams are knocking the ball out of the park in terms of results. 80% are at or significantly above the national level of their counterparts on these 160 uh, exams and, or degrees and certificates. And there are many, many more of these wonderful stories and I will also add my pitch, look at the dashboard that is provided and it demonstrates uh, that quality. So I will just want to say thank you to the uh, Higher Ed Board for the work you're doing. Thank you for uh, working with us on our studies and your staff has been uh, working closely with the Legislative Council and uh, we appreciate that very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. That was excellent. Um, our uh, chairman of the board at Microsoft, Bill Gates, would embrace you heartily with your data-driven uh, metrics around decision making. Um, that is, tr those are some great stats. And um, data-driven decision making makes us all better decision makers. I liked your reference to who's on first. I think when we talk about innovation and change and everything, we should keep in mind that sometimes that what gets in the way of innovation is sometimes an institution, a department, an individual ends up on third base and thinks they hit a triple. And uh, that can sometimes lead to complacency. A year ago, um, at our board retreat, we invited a local businessman from Fargo, and I'm not gonna use names because this is a political season, but we invited a local businessman from Fargo with deep roots at Great Plains and Microsoft to come and address our board, and he shared some great ideas. Um, and I, my goal in life is to have an original idea. I've never had that experience yet. Uh, so I will borrow from this Fargo businessman. But when he talked to us, um, he uh, talked about innovation. And what it, to be an innovator, it takes diversity, diversity of thought, ethnic diversity, racial diversity, all kinds of diversity, gender diversity. Diverse teams are more innovative. But he also talked about humility. It takes great humility to innovate. It takes great humility to, to admit that you may not be the smartest person in the room. It takes great humility to realize that things that you hold dear may not be, be, be true. And innovation is also very much a team sport. When it comes to humility, someone gave me some great advice many years ago. They said, if at first you do succeed, try to hide your astonishment. <laughs> and my wife helps me out with this. When I was at the University of Wisconsin my first year, we had a big upset win over Ohio State. Uh, 
We, uh, <laughs> we have an Ohio State alumnus in the front row. <laughs> but we, we had a big upset win over Ohio State. And I went home after that game, and I was feeling pretty good. And I said to my wife, Sue, how many great coaches are there in this country? I mean, really great coaches, 9, 10. She looked me straight in the eye and said, one less than you think. <laughs> uh, so humility is a very important part of the game. Um, we are going to shift gears and, and start to get into the core of what we're here today. And we're going to start with a panel discussion. That panel will be led by our very distinguished Lieutenant Governor, Drew Wrigley. Um, Drew is uh, North Dakota's 37th Lieutenant Governor. He's a fourth generation North Dakota native. He's a Fargo South graduate. Um, he graduated from law school in Washington, D.C. Uh, President Bush appointed him as our um, to the North to, to United States Attorney. He served in that role until 2009. Wrigley also serves as the President of the North Dakota Senate and chairs the State Investment Board, the Higher Education Challenge Grant Board, the Unmanned Aircraft Systems Test Site Authority, and the North Dakota Trade Office Board, among other responsibilities. He's a busy guy. Um, Wrigley and his wife Kathleen have three children. Please help me welcome our Lieutenant Governor Drew Wrigley. introduce the other panelists. I thought Don was going through all that humility stuff because he's going to say, may I please introduce the not smartest guy in the room. That's what I thought you were going to do. Uh, why, don't, why don't my other panelists, why don't you come on up and we'll just get started because we're kind of a little bit behind here. We want to get rolling and we've got a lot of uh, interesting ideas for you. I'm going to sit down right here. Join us on stage. Just sit wherever it's comfortable. We'll commence. I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to uh, chair this panel today. I, uh, is the mic on? Do you hear us all right? Red on or? Yeah, red on. Okay, good. You can't hear us? Senator Heckman says she can't hear us. Mic's not on. How about now? All right. Can you hear this? That's better. All right, we'll just use that for now. Move the governor. All right. This, uh, <laughs> we're trying to get room here. This is not the hardest part of this. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. This is going to become more complicated <laughs> as we go along. The questions, that's a chair. All right, good. This panel is going to be addressing uh, the demographics uh, that compromise or that comprise K through 12 education and commerce in the state of North Dakota and how these statistics relate to the challenges and opportunities for our great state. The governor started this morning by saying he's going to give you a piece of his mind. I'm going to give you a piece of my mind too, and that is thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, what an interesting morning so far, and we really appreciate that. And thanks to the panelists uh, who have agreed to be here today. I certainly agree with what Don was saying. You, you can't improve what you don't measure. It's impossible. I've certainly uh, felt that way across my career, whether it's in, in the work here as the lieutenant governor at the trade office, state investment board, challenge grant plan, whatever it might be. Uh, in, in my years as U.S. Attorney as well. And I think that's critically important. So thank all of you in advance for helping us kind of establish that uh, uh, baseline uh, for our discussion. What we're going to do is I'm going to introduce the panel quickly. They're each going to give you a brief uh, presentation, and then we're going to do some questions and discussion. And then I'm going to do what I'll call a Lieutenant Governor Audible. This wasn't mentioned in there, but I, we'd really like your questions uh, that get sparked by the, the discussion up here today. And we'll take some time at the end of our presentation uh, for that as well, if we could. I'll start by introducing our panelists. First, we have Mr. Kevin Iverson. Kevin serves as the manager of the North Dakota Census Office. Uh, he, the office functions as both the state's data center and the state's representative in the federal state population estimate program. In addition to that, Kevin is the governor's liaison to the Census Bureau. His educational background includes a, a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration, as well as a Master's of Business Administration from the University of North Dakota. What an excellent education. I agree. <laughs> Just, I, I may have gone to school near or at there. Um, Kevin's going to be discussing population estimates, state uh, rankings for education, trends in education attainment, and external comparisons. And he's also going to answer any questions that you have for him. So thanks for being here. Kirsten Baszler, seated right here to my right. She's the superintendent of North Dakota Department of Public Instruction. Early in her term, uh, Kirsten and I and a couple of other people were in the state plane flying uh, over to Valley City. And it was windy, really windy. And uh, the plane was more or less flying in a straight trajectory, but it was also moving around in other directions to give us different views. 
And as we were coming in landing, I was reading through some uh, materials to prepare my final touches on my remarks. And I looked up and Kirsten was both green and completely white. <laughs> and I looked at her, I kind of smiled. We we're coming in there, it was going like this, the plane's flying all over. The other people didn't seem very plussed on the plane either, but I, I just looked back down on my paper and I said, Kirsten, don't worry about it. We're gonna be on the ground shortly, one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, everything I learned about Kirsten that day is also true. She loves people to fly. And then she wants you to stay aloft and we really appreciate uh, how much she cares about the kids uh, in this great state and the education that they're getting. Prior to becoming a superintendent, Kirsten had a 23-year career in the Bismarck public school system. She's a former vice principal, library media specialist, teacher, and also an instructional assistant. She's also worked for the North Dakota School Boards Association. She's going to be discussing high school graduation rates, the K-12 public enrollment in the state of North Dakota, and performance levels in math, science, you name it, any of your questions as well. To my far right, Dr. Larry Skogan. Dr. Skogan is the sixth CEO of Bismarck State College. After retiring from a career in the United States Air Force, he has been a high school teacher, college faculty member in a variety of military and civilian institutions, including the US Air Force Academy. Larry has a doctorate in history from Arizona State University, a Master of Arts in History from the University of Central Missouri, and a Bachelor of Science in Secondary Education from Dickinson State University. Apparently also has ADD on that background. That's incredible. You've been a lot of places. I also, we note uh, your term as the interim chancellor uh, for our higher education system. And everybody here appreciates the work that you did. When Larry was first being mentioned, I was someone I called Larry and I really encouraged him to do that. I thought that he should do that, take on that responsibility. And then after he did, I said, Larry, why have you done this to yourself in your career? <laughs> That's what happens in politics. Everybody encourages you, and then you go do something, and they're like, what in the world's wrong with you? Uh, but Larry, thanks for that and your great work at BSC going on and also just being a leader in the state. Larry's going to be discussing campus demographics, mode of education, uh, North Dakota college enrollment, and the North Dakota University System mission study. Over to my left immediately, uh, Andy Peterson. Andy is the president and the CEO of the Greater North Dakota Chamber. He has served in that position since October 2010. Prior to that, he was the Director of Public Policy for the Duluth Area Chamber of Commerce. We held that uh, set of responsibilities for 12 years. He's going to be discussing what demographics spell out for our state, who we are dealing with in the marketplace, anticipated business needs across our state and region, the effects of creative destruction, artificial intelligence and automation, market forces, and the law, this is going to be long. <laughs> uh, the law of unintended consequences and the need for flexibility, preparedness, concentration and focus, competitiveness, self-confidence, stress management, humility, and adaptiveness and learning ability. It sounds like you and I, when I'm going to be looking for a job in December, you're going to be my coach. We're gonna, <laughs> that's going to be good. Thanks for bringing all that uh, to the panel here today. And with that, I'm going to give the floor back to Kevin. Get us started. Kevin Iverson. There you are. I assume I can use this to advance the slide here. You bet. Real quick. Okay, let me just step over here just a little bit. Uh, first of all, I want to start off with our coffee. Can you hear me? No, no. You gave me a dead mic. I didn't do anything to it. Well, now it's not. Now you can hear me. There. That's one, two, three. It's the other one. It's the other one, right? This is the one that was. You're tricky. I got to remember that. Okay, start off real quick with the uh, population projections that we uh, published in, in uh, January of this year. Uh, certainly, a level of uncertainty uh, in terms of how fast the population would, would grow in the state of North Dakota. But uh, what we expected by 2030, we would be looking at about 931,000 people, roughly. Now, uh, if you consider, uh, we've gained uh, about 80 some thousand. Uh, from 2010 to 2015, very rapid growth. One of the assumptions, or a couple of the assumptions were we would see less in migration, uh, but greater growth as a result of natural rate, which is simply births over deaths, uh, each, uh, each of the five year periods on. Uh, the uh, 2020, what well, we expected about 824,000 individuals in the state, uh, continue with Cass County as the largest county, uh, Burley County uh, as the, uh, second largest county, uh, and uh, Grand Forks, uh, excuse me, Ward the third. Now, if you haven't caught the uh, most recent population estimate that came out by county in, in March, Ward surpassed uh, Grand Forks. The city of Minot is not larger than 
uh, Grand Forks City, uh, but the county uh, is estimated to be larger, and that would continue on in that period of time. The, big, the biggest scenario that by 2020 happens is the uh, two eastern, excuse me, the, the four eastern governor's planning regions and the four western planning regions are almost balanced in terms of size in the estimate. We continue at this point in time, we expect that the four eastern uh, sides will be just a little bit, uh, areas will be just a little bit larger than the west. Obviously, uh, the Fargo area being the largest, but uh, the state begins to balance out for the first time. Uh, if our assumptions are correct, uh, by 2030, uh, combine the four western regions would be slightly larger than the four eastern regions of the state. Uh, the greatest growth continues to be in the uh, Fargo area, but all four of the western planning regions are growing. Uh, particularly the Devil's Lake and the Jamestown regions have been, are shown to be kind of flat during this period of time. So uh, uh, the greatest growth again, Fargo, and then followed by all four of the western regions. I'm going to skip through these for the period for the uh, use of time. Uh, this is the uh, 2014 population pyramid of the state. On the uh, left is males, on the right is females, and start off so starts off on the bottom uh, with children uh, less than one and up through age 84. And you can see this very large uh, group in migration that we had, kind of the ba the bottom of the uh, the millennials. Uh, what's really key about that is uh, that's right in the uh, primary childbearing ages, or the, kind of the bottom of the, of the uh, childbearing ages. And so uh, that has an impact on the uh, number of children that are born in each succeeding year. But underneath that, you'll see this narrowing band in the teenage years that grows uh, gradually as we get closer and closer to the bottom or the base of the po population pyramid. Well, what that translates into uh, for the next few years is the number of children that are, they'll be turning age 18 or the college age uh, we're going to go through a little bit of a dip, followed by a little bit of a uh, begin to climb after the next few years. Now, if our population projections are correct, this area where it levels off doesn't really level off. It would continue to climb uh, from that period on. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, the population of the state of North Dakota and how it relates at each level. And, and first of all, I started off at high school graduation level and rank order of the 50 states. So what I took, took is the 50 states, the District of, District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. And for those of you who did not bring your binoculars with today, uh, <laughs> North Dakota is shown over here with 91% of the population, 25 and over, uh, having a high school diploma or, or GED. We're in a very good neighborhood. The other uh, area in red here is the United States at 86%. So I'm just gonna move on up through the educational levels. So having obtained some college, in other words, they've, they've at least put their foot in the door of some institution. In the state of North Dakota, it's 64%. We're still in a fairly good company, uh, beating the United States average again. Move on to associate's degree. Uh, we rank just a little bit lower, but we're actually uh, doing quite well again, uh, beating the US average uh, in uh, closer to the top of the 50 states District of Columbia uh, and Puerto Rico. When it gets the bachelor's degree, for the first time, we're a little bit below the national average. Now, there's more to that story, and I'll show you another slide in a little bit when we break this up by age groups. Uh, but uh, this is the first time we're below the national average. And if I move on to the next slide, which is the graduate or professional level, uh, the U.S. is 8%. We're now towards uh, the bottom tier states in the bottom 10. Uh, and this is uh, area from the data from the American Community Survey. If we look in terms of education, this is all the same data we saw before, but now this just in, in one slide compares the U.S. average, or U.S. US uh, completion rates at those level uh, to the state of North Dakota. And as you can see, uh, everything through associate's degree, uh, we beat the U.S. average, and then we're a little bit low at, below at the, uh, at the bachelor's degree and professional, uh, graduate professional level. When we look at high school diploma uh, graduations, uh, for those of you, again, who didn't bring your binoculars, the United States is shown in the blue, uh, the state of North Dakota is in the red. We break it down by age groups, uh, only at 65 and above do we have a lower uh, a percentage having high school diplomas than the U.S. average. When we look at bachelor's level, uh, it, and specifically at the age group over 45, we're below the national average, 
but under 45 years of age were above the national average. Uh, now, I also wanted to look at mean, er mean earnings by uh, level e education. And if you were skipping the first uh, bars, and if you just look at the blue bars from uh, in the second column is less than high school up through graduate professional level. These are the average in thousands of dollars per year in earnings uh, of, of individuals in the United States between 2010 and 2014. And, and just looking at the blue, you see a fairly steep uh, curve that goes on. If you just look at the red now, you'll see that although it is, you certainly do make more uh, by having a higher education in the state of North Dakota, the, the slope of the line is not as great. Conversely, uh, the penalty, or the, and I measured this by the percentage of individuals uh, being in poverty. Uh, you can see in, in the United States, if you have less than high school education, 28% of those individuals during this period of time are in poverty. Well, the penalty is not quite as severe for being less educated in the state of North Dakota. I also uh, spent a great deal of time uh, breaking down the population by North Dakota residents who were born in North Dakota, uh, those who were born in North Dakota then left the state, uh, are currently a resident of some other state, and those individuals who were born outside the state and are current residents of the state of North Dakota. There are about 15 million samples uh, in the American Community Survey, and I broke my computer a number of times before I was able to find a way to get this to run. But as you can see, the, graduate, the high school graduation rates uh, for, for those individuals who's move, moved are just slightly higher, but there is certainly a difference between those individuals who are, uh, were born and remain current residents of the state and those individuals who left. But it's also uh, a higher percentage of individuals who were born elsewhere and moved into the state of North Dakota uh, than, than that population that, that was born here and uh, is still a current resident. Now, part of the problem in, in doing this, they may have been born in, in East Grand Forks, uh, they may have left last year, they may have left the day after they were born. Uh, there's really no way to tell, but we can only tell looking at the American Community Survey data where they were born and where, what they are currently carrying, uh, 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 claiming as a residency. I also want to just touch on a little bit of, of uh, educational attainment by race and ethnicity. Uh, the first column is the all, which is all individuals in the state of North Dakota. Uh, no, surprising, uh, no surprise here, the white population matches it exactly. The black population does very close in terms of the uh, uh, black bachelor's degree completion, but is a little bit less in terms of high school diplomas. Now, a lot of this, those individuals likely moved into the state of North Dakota in just the last few years. Uh, American Indians, uh, we fall short. There's about just under 40,000 uh, individuals in this estimate, and, and about 14% of them have completed a, a bachelor's degree or higher. Uh, if you're looking for uh, the lowest in terms of high school diploma, we actually find that in our Hispanic population, which is, again, uh, a large growth. Uh, our, from 2010 to 2014, that population almost doubled in the state. Uh, and so uh, a lot of them, many of them are coming without, uh, without high school diplomas. Uh, and if you want to find the most educated group, Clearly, it's the uh, individuals from Asia. Uh, this 51% uh, diploma, uh, or bachelor's degree or higher, matches the US average of 51% for that same period of time. And so by far, uh, very, very highly educated. And, and Pacific Islanders, even though it's a very small group, very, cl very closely matches that. I'll hand the mic back to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Next, we'll call on Kirsten Basler. You want to, are you going to be standing up? Um, so However you like. Okay. Yes. Good after, or good morning to all of you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to Chancellor Hagerett and to the university staff for um, help inviting us today to include K-12 as a part of us, this conversation. It is truly a critical part 
And thank you to the Board of Higher Education for always having us as part of that conversation as we work with you to um, in this cyclical operation that we have as you deliver our teachers to us and hopefully we deliver as prepared students um, as we can to you. I want to talk to you today just a little bit about um, the demographics in North Dakota. So as you can see from this chart, or these uh, several charts, North Dakota public school enrollment uh, was on a steady decline for a number of years. The population losses that we experienced in the 1980s translated into school enrollment losses in the 80s and the 90s. Both are rural schools, which are considered other on the second column of the graph on your left, and our big nine school districts all saw loss of students. Uh, for clarification, the big nine school districts are school districts with enrollment of 2,000 students or more. Those include Bismarck, Dickinson, Fargo, Grand Forks, Jamestown, Mandan, Minot, West Fargo, and Williston. The decline bottomed out for all of our schools in aggregate in 2009. It started to turn around, the, the enrollment decline turned around in our big nine in about 2008, and it turned around in 2011 for our smaller schools. Enrollment since that time has been um, steadily increasing throughout our state. In fact, enrollment rose by 14% in seven years from 2009 to 2016, an increase from 93,406 students to 106,070 students. And our growth is really benefiting all of our school districts across the state, both large and small, as you can see. The top graph on the right-hand side is our North Dakota resident births, and that's one of the factors that North Dakota uses to determine and project what our student enrollment uh, pr uh, calculations will be. And you will see that the future enrollment increases are expected to be strong in the next few years from kindergarten and our, our elementary grades. The increasing birth rate from 8,381 live resident births in 2005 to 11,352 in 2015 is a 35% increase over the, over the last 10 years. This is significant. You see that uh, 2012 is the last piece of data that we have, and there is a significant uptick there as well. Those young people are our first year of pre-K students that are entering. And they will be, in 2017, when we start this new journey, um, they will be our graduates in 2030, so it's very fitting that we have Vision 2030. The diverse economy, as I move forward, is really, this is kind of a hard slide to see, but the diverse economy is spurring growth in all areas of our state, not just oil, our oil patch areas. The blue shading, and the white, light white to blue shading is our areas of increased population, uh, of at least one or more. We still do have some areas of declining population, but all the way from less than one to greater than 25, and the degree of red indicates that. But you'll notice with this graph, and I wanted to share this with you, that um, it isn't just in our, in our Bakken area. It, the diverse economy that we have with our diversification, our agriculture, our um, unmanned air systems, all of the technology that is occurring, occurring on the eastern part of our state is significant. The next thing I want to talk to you about is the challenges that we have in our changing demographics, if you will. North Dakota has one of the most, the fastest growing population of our English language learners. 70% of all ELL students are in eastern North Dakota. And to be more specific, I will tell you that they are in Grand Forks, West Fargo, and Fargo. Fargo has 23% of our English language learners. West Fargo has 18% and Grand Forks has 7%. This is significant. Spanish, as you could imagine, is our, our top language of ELL students. 30% of our English language learners are um, Spanish speaking. But the other top languages are Somalian, Nepali, Arabic, and Creole. Somali, we have 14%. Nepali, we have 12%. Arabic, we have 5%. There are currently 92 different languages other than English that are spoken in our North Dakota schools. That's significant. We have some languages that are so obscure, and this is anecdotal, but I was visiting with the West Fargo 
superintendent, so obscure that they need to arrange for a translator in that native country. There is no app, if you will, that will translate at this point in time. And so to visit with these parents, to visit with the students and, and all of the family components that are so important in K-12 education is quite a challenge. So as we become more diverse and, and we embrace that as a state, it is a challenge for our school system. The next thing that I want to visit with you about is um, some conversation that the governor um, spoke about this morning. I think he put it pretty bluntly when he said the senior year is significantly, I think he used a waste, I think is the word that he used. We recognize that that is a challenge that we have in the state of North Dakota. And this, this data on the screen right now does provide the evidence for several things that we have felt and known that we needed to address in this state. We have very eager seventh and eighth graders in the state. 62 of our seventh graders take classes for high school credit. Eighth graders, 825. You see that they're still pretty robust and, and motivated in our ninth grade year. Their average high school credits taken at ninth grade is 6.1 credits. You see it peak at our 10th grade year at 6.28 credits. 11th grade, it starts to decline, 6.11. And you see what Governor Dalrymple was talking about. Their senior year, right before they head to the big show, if you will, they take the least amount of credits. This evidence really does support other um, pieces of data that I began um, being presented with when I was first elected and first took office in 2013. North Dakota was 50th in the nation of the number of students that took advanced placement courses, and 51st in the nation of the number of students that took advanced placement exams in order to try to obtain credit for college. The good news is, of the students that did challenge the exam, we were one of the highest in the nation. So what that said to us at the Department of Public Instruction, said to us in K-12, is that we needed to provide more opportunities for more of our students to t not only take advanced placement courses, in addition to the dual credit courses that they take, but to also feel confident enough in their learning that they would challenge the exam and earn that credit. So with the support of the legislature and through some great testimonials from my student cabinet that I have, if any of you don't know about my student cabinet, I'd ask you to visit with me about that. But I heard from my stu superintendent's student cabinet that they wanted more opportunities for dual credit, more opportunities for advanced placement. Many of our students across the state had taken all of the classes that were available to them by their 11th grade year. So we needed to go about fixing that. And as I said, the legislature did a fine job in 2015. They provided $1.2 million to the Department of Public Instruction to encourage um, more students to have more opportunities. So we are working with the Center for Distance Ed in order to have more of our teachers trained in teaching advanced placement courses. For the first time this year, we have offered to cover the cost of at least one advanced placement course exam because we found out that exam fees were a significant hurdle for some of these young people to challenge that exam. So all students in North Dakota, regardless of socioeconomic status, will have the state pay for at least one advanced placement exam in the areas of math, English, or science, and then up to three more at 50%. Our socioeconomic challenge, our disadvantaged students, can take up to four advanced placement exams and have those exams paid for by the state. So we hope to see those numbers change in the near future. Our graduation rates. Um, we have what I've called an honesty gap in the state of North Dakota, probably in the nation for a long time. We have, the honesty gap is, is something that we need to address. We've been, and I'll use these words, we've been misinforming and oftentimes outright lying to our students about how prepared they are to succeed at the next level. Our students are in, there was one high school district, I'll just use them as an example. Um, they had a tough conversation with their own district. Over 85% of their student body was graduating on the B honor roll or higher. Yet, that same student body was having over 35% of their students were needing remediation courses their first year 
either at a four-year regional, a community, or a, a two-year research. That's not okay. That honesty gap is not okay. The time to find out that you're not quite ready to do what you choose to do after high school isn't the summer before you start that journey. Senator, excuse, yeah, Senator Heitkamp said it early. She, she believed, she said it earlier, she believes that that preparation starts in pre-K, and I agree. We need to begin to prepare our students. But we certainly need to be, be more honest with our parents and our students earlier than high school. I would rather find out as a parent whether my student was on track to be successful in third grade at the end of second grade, whether they're gonna be successful in middle school at the end of their elementary career, and to have more of an honest assessment. The proficiency rates on our former state assessment were saying that somewhere between 78 and 80 percent of our students were consistently proficient, meaning that they should be able to challenge whatever their next step is. Yet the NAEP exam, which is considered the nation's report card, was indicating that we're right about, more about 40 percent of our students were ready for college level or career level coursework in um, their first year out of high school. That is more along the line of what we begin to see with our state assessment that we're giving now. So we're turning that around and we're hoping to correct that, but we need to continue to be honest and need to continue to change the trajectory and change the reporting system that we have so we can adjust our instruction in K-12. The goal of the Department of Public Instruction has been and has recently become, we're trying to brand this so you can help us with that, to ensure that all of our students are choice ready by the time that they finish their experience with us, their K-12 experience with us. That they are choice ready. Meaning that whatever they choose to do, whether it would be enter the work world immediately, go to a career and technical school, enter a, a regional university or a research university, or enter the military. Whatever they choose to do, that we have prepared them well enough and provided them enough knowledge, experiences, skills, and disposition so that the choice is theirs and we're not limiting. We don't want to identify or track or put more emphasis on the importance of one path versus another path, but our goal is to ensure that we have all of our students prepared for their choice. Right now, our high school graduation rate is the highest it's ever been, 87.2%. 87.2% in the state of North Dakota. We're proud of that, but we want to have an increased graduation rate with a decreased need for remediation. One thing that is a concern and is our greatest challenge is that our Native American graduation rate is only 64.6%. We have not moved that needle more than one or two percentage points in over the last two decades. If we are going to remain to be a state that is on the leading edge of this nation and be able to really fill all of the careers that are yet to be created, we need to make sure that every North Dakota citizen is choice ready and prepared to do what they choose to do and help us lift this great state up to its next level. So those are the demographics and the challenges that we face in K-12. We have a number of other challenges. It's, it's a huge ecosystem. We have um, the breakout sessions. We'll deal with some of those this afternoon. Our mental health, the traditional, um, the role of, the changing role of the traditional classroom. But again, I will end how I started. The university system has been a fantastic partner dealing, helping us deal with so many of these issues, staying current on what our students need for their future, helping us provide the quality teachers in all of the areas that we need in the state of North Dakota. And I want to thank them. Thank you so much. Thanks, Superintendent Baszler. Dr. Skogan. It was difficult getting in that chair. <laughs> I want you to know. I'm not here to judge. Okay. <laughs> Let's see, where's the clicker at? Okay. 
guess we need another presentation. You know, while they're loading this up, let me, uh, uh, just to tell you this, for anybody that wants to beat themselves up about remedial education and whether high school students are prepared and all that sort of stuff, um, I had the very good fortune of being on faculty at the United States Air Force Academy, and Dr. Hagra was on faculty at the Naval Academy, and I can promise you, we used to sit around in the faculty lounges and complain about the students not being prepared for college and 98% of the students that go to those two institutions are valedictorians of their classes. So this is not a North Dakota issue where we should beat ourselves up. Doesn't mean we don't want to address it, but it's, an, it's a very large national issue of making sure students are prepared when they leave K-12 that they're ready for college. And that's a national thing and, and every state is working on it just like, just like we're working on it. Okay, um, I'm going to talk uh, very quickly, hopefully, uh, about cam uh, campus demographics, a little bit about mode of education. Uh, Representative Sanford mentioned that. A little bit about student completion, and then just touch on the NDUS mission study, and I'll tell you where we are with that. Uh, to begin with, I hope that isn't too washed out for all of you, but this is the North Dakota University headcount and FTE enrollment, uh, 2006 through 2000, and I'm standing in your way, right? So I'll walk around so all of you can see it a little bit. What you will note, is, first let me tell you, FTE is just a calculation. They take the full number of students that you have there and the full credits and they divide that and they come up with an FTE. How many students do you have on campus is reflected by the other number. And so you have, uh, in this is 2011 and 2012 basically, that's when we capped out at about 45,000 students across the North Dakota University system and then we've declined and, and sort of stayed flat after that. So uh, the slides that you saw from, uh, from Kirsten and from Kevin show you what has happened to high school graduations. Most of our students come to us from obviously within our local areas. About 60% of students go to college within 100 miles of where they grew up. That's where they go to college and uh, about 80% within 500 miles. So as our high school graduation rates, and I'm just gonna be parochial about it, talking about Bismarck here, we're sitting in the middle of the state. So as our high school graduates drop in Burley and Morton County, uh, we can just expect our enrollments to drop as a result of that. So you take that statewide, and that's why you've seen this we were rising and then we dropped a little bit. And then what's gonna happen for any of you that are in K-12, and I know Kirsten hears this and I, I hear this when I go out to the public schools, that there's a big bubble. One, one superintendent described this as a snake that has swallowed a frog. So you're gonna watch this big bubble that's coming along in what, middle school right now, there's a big bubble coming along. So we all anticipate uh, in the university system then that when that bubble starts coming out, in about two or three years, then our enrollments would just naturally go up because that's where our students come from, is from our local area predominantly. So we'll see these numbers go back up. Okay, let's take a look at head counts in 2016. Um, just to show you, uh, North Dakota University system, uh, roughly 10,000 of the students end up going to our community colleges, about 6,800 to the re uh, regionals, and then 27,000 to the uh, two big universities, NDSU and UND. That would be unusual in many states. Um, you take the state of Wyoming, for example, has one four-year institution, and they've got, I think, 13 two-year colleges. So if you look at their demographics, it's gonna be very, very different. We have a lot of four-year schools in our state, and uh, the governor uh, talked a little bit about that. One of the things that we're looking at in our mission study is we're going way back um, to the, the start that uh, Chancellor Hagerot talked about. And uh, in the state, they, they started off with a lot of actually normal schools or two-year colleges, and then a lot of those transitioned to four-year colleges, and that's why we've got four-year colleges around the state. The governor talked about access, um, and North Dakota voters have time and time again said we will continue that access. And, and so any attempt to change the Constitution on the number of four-year institutions has been beaten back by the voters in the state of North Dakota. And w we talk about that in our uh, mission study. Okay, so our demographics, this again is hard to see, um, but if you take a look at uh, our full-time headcount and uh, part-time headcount, uh, and I'll read some of these for you. So NDSU, for example, has 78.9% of their students are full-time students. Uh, you take a community college like Bismarck State College, 
of ours are full-time students. So a community college, you expect to have far more part-time students. We have a lot of working people. We don't, have, we don't have the big numbers of the traditional students like UND and NDSU have and some of our other four-year partners. But there is a growing trend nationally for more and more students to become part-time students. More and more students work and go to school, and particularly the community colleges, there's just more and more students that'll take three, three hours or six hours, and they just uh, go on until they complete their certificate or their degree or whatever they're working on. So there's a high number of, uh, of part-time students. Um, let's take a look at residency down here. Um, so, and again, my parochialism, because this is what I understand the best, Bismarck State College. So we're 78% North Dakota students. Well, it's because we're in the middle of the state, okay? <laughs> we're, we're sitting in the middle of the state, and so when we draw that 100-mile line around Bismarck State College, and I'll show you a, a graph of that, most of our students come from central North Dakota. Now, if you come over here and you look at uh, NDSU and UND, you can see NDSU, North Dakota, 41%, uh, and UND is 34%. Well, it's because if you know, if Dean or Ed spit out their window, they can hit the Red River, almost. Um, and, and so they're so close to the border that when you take that 100-mile line again, there's going to be a lot of students within that line that are in Minnesota, just natural that they're in Minnesota and that they're, they're attracted to North Dakota. So um, let's see. Then, of course, um, so just walking across here then, if you take a look at the location of these institutions and you walked across the Minnesota line, you can see the closer you get to Minnesota, the larger that number is. So UND is 33%, uh, NDSU is 44%, uh, Mayville's 14%, and who else is down there? John Richmond, uh, almost 21%, and NDSCS. He's another one that can hit the Red River out of his office. So um, just a little bit about that. In uh, North Dakota in the 1990s, well, two things. One is the 100-mile radius. You're going to draw Minnesota students in because you're within, one, within 100 miles of their school. And in the 1990s, the state was concerned about enrollments at the four-year institutions, and they established then through the State Board of Higher Ed reciprocity, the Minnesota Reciprocity Agreement. So Minnesotans pay about, what is it, 1.120%? But... but but 120 uh, percent, and then the the balance, nearly the balance of that, then is paid uh, by the state of Minnesota. So North Dakota gets a check every year from the state of Minnesota for the number of students that that are coming from Minnesota and coming to school in North Dakota. That's part of the reciprocity agreement. Okay, I was asked, and that's just that's a real rough outline of the demographics of, of who attends North Dakota uh, University System schools. I was asked to also talk about the mode of education, and Senator Sanford already alluded to that, and so did the governor about the mode of, or mode of education. So Bismarck State College, let's take, for example, we have 1,785 students that are on our campus, full-time, traditional, face-to-face -face education. So people will say, well, then that's all you've got coming on your campus. Well, no, we've got 642 that are both on campus and online. And one of the things that was already alluded to on, and Representative Sanford did about what is distance learning? Well, I grew up in Hedinger. When distance learning started, we thought that was the thing that Larry Scogan, sitting in Hedinger, could take a course from Bismarck State College or UND or NDSU, and that's what distance learning is. But what we're finding out is that, as you can see here, I've got 642 students on my campus that are also taken online. Now, it might be, A, that their schedule, they've got a work schedule, and that class that they need is in the afternoon, and they're working in the afternoon, so they just decide to take it online instead. That might be the situation. I don't know what the situation is. <laughs> it's so fluid. But we have many, many students that walk onto our campus, are part of our campus community, and are taking online courses. And they might do that one semester, they might do it three semesters, who knows? They might do it their entire career. So then, that says that we've got 1,324 that are online only. So then the next comment is, you never see these students. They'll never be on your campus. Well, when you take a look at the demographics of these students, 
of our 1,324 students that take online classes exclusively, 323 of them live in Burley and Morton County. They come to our campus, they meet with the advisors, they meet with the faculty members, they go, come to the bookstore, they are part of our campus. They live right here in Burley and Morton County. And they might do this one semester again. They might do it two semesters. They might do it, they might do it their entire career. They've decided that they're going to take a course or a program from Bismarck State College. They want to take it online, and they're part of our community. Then there's another uh, 204 of those students that live in other North Dakota counties, and that means they could be close enough. They could be up here in Wilton, and they could drive down or wherever they're at. They could be close, or they might be in Grand Forks or Fargo. So then that means we've got 797 that actually live out of state, and I'll talk more about those students. So of our student body for this spring, of, the, of all of our student body, 73% of our students live in Burley and Morton County. They're actually on our campus, they're living in our community, they're participating in our campus life, they're coming up for basketball games or whatever. So now let's take a quick, and, and again, we're looking at Bismarck State College, I could do this for every one of the institutions, or uh, the other presidents could do it for their institutions. So the 100 miles, again, most of our student body comes from Burley and Morton County. Now we get students from all over the state, but most of our student body comes from the center of the state. So if you were sitting here at Grand Forks, you'd find most of your student body comes from a circle like that. Uh, NDSU would find most of their students are coming. And again, these two schools are going to have students from all over, from every one of the counties as well. But they're going to find most of their students are going to come within 100 miles of that. But now let's take a look at nationally. So, the, so I mentioned 790 students are out of state. So this shows you our, uh, first, most of our students are North Dakota students, but we have students in almost all of the states. This time, this uh, last year, uh, New Jersey had zero, and this is purely a coincidence. My son moved to New Jersey <laughs> with three grandkids, okay? And I told him one of them's gonna take a college course from Bismarck State College, okay? And the fact that our chair of the Board of Education comes from New Jersey may, I don't know if that has anything to do with the zero. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, but, it, but nevertheless, so then people say, well, why are you educating all those students? Well, uh, the senator mentioned, for example, we're not an island. There's not a moat around North Dakota. Uh, Basin Electric has been a marvelous partner of Bismarck State College. They are in nine states. And so Bismarck State College, working with Basin Electric, is educating students in nine states. MDU has been a marvelous partner of Bismarck State College. They're in 35 states. So when these corporations step up and say, we're going to be a partner with Bismarck State College, or with NDSU, or UND, or Mayville, or Valley City, or whoever it is, when they say, we're going to be a partner with you, they're not expecting us just to focus on students in our local communities. They're, they've partnered with us for a reason, and so, um, but at any rate, so that's a very quick snapshot of that. Um, completion rates, uh, the chancellor actually showed you a newer chart, and that's good because what I was going to point out here is in North Dakota, now this number is, is um, excuse me, in North Dakota, the public university number is now uh, I think at the national average you're showing. So that's gone up. This, this chart's about three years old. So North Dakota, uh, that number has gone up. These numbers have stayed about the same. What's really interesting about this is that North Dakota, and this has been mentioned, we have the best transfer program in the nation. Students that go for one year at one of our colleges or universities can then transfer to one of the other colleges and universities. It is seamless. We have the exact same numbering systems. We have the same names for all the courses. It is a system, and there's no other state. We are the envy of other states that can do that sort of transfer. Well, one of the, one of the downsides of that is that we have a very fluid system then. Students can start at one university, they can transfer to the other university. It's almost seamless for them to do that, and they do that, and then our, our, it, it affects our graduation rates. Okay, um, mission study. I was asked to talk very quickly about that. In the fall, Chancellor established the North Dakota mission study. He asked me to lead that uh, task force. The primary question, and I'll read this because I, 
I know it's a long way back there. Are the states and each region's economic education and workforce needs being met by the current structure of and program delivery methods and levels of the North Dakota University system and its individual institutions? Are we meeting the workforce needs of the state? We are focused this study is focused on the results of meeting the workforce needs in lieu of talking about numbers of institutions, locations, and missions, and duplication, and I know that is a concern. Duplication is a concern. There have been de different definitions of duplication, but what the, an uh, the chancellor asked me to do is to lead this task force looking at the missions of the North Dakota University system institutions, and are we meeting the workforce need. If we're not, then what adjustments can we make to do that? So in June, I will be briefing the results of that study to the State Board of Higher Ed. And in August, I will be briefing that to Representative Sanford's committee. We'll have all the statistics. We have been using, the governor mentioned, the high in high demand occupations. We have used that. We're using the data of the um, North Dakota University system production, the degrees and the certificates and the completions of all of those, and a number of other databases. So uh, I will be briefing that in June and then again in August. And that concludes mine. Thank you, Dr. Skogan. Next up, Andy Peterson. Thank you, Drew. So good to be here. I'm not going to use a PowerPoint, and I will be uh, fairly brief today. Last week in Washington, D.C., I attended a meeting of the National Association of Manufacturers. They were, of course, talking about the need for STEM education. STEM education, fairly standard thing, right? So they quoted some statistics. And Perry, you're a manufacturer. What year were they talking about the demand for STEM education? What year were they referring to? Forever. This is a smart man. Perry's a manufacturer. This report that they were quoting from was from 1952, the need for STEM education, encouraging kids to go into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This is nothing new. I think what the demographics are showing and what we're seeing today is that the need for education is there, has been there, and will remain there. But I think there are a few things that are <coughs> happening in our society today that will present some challenges. So I really want to talk a little bit about that. This whole role of creative destruction. I remember my very, what I would consider my very first real job we did get a copy machine that year, and uh, that copy machine took about 60 seconds per copy. There wasn't a feed tray into it. You lifted the top up, you put it down, you pressed a button, you went and got a cup of coffee, and you smoked a cigarette, because you could smoke a cigarette in the office in those <laughs> days. And I did date myself. So if you think about the degree of creative destruction that is happening in our society today, everything is changing it at a rapid pace. Uh, over the weekend, my in-laws, quite elderly, came to visit, and, and if you ask, I will tell you that it was a long weekend. But uh, I took my father-in-law, yes, some of you got that. Uh, thank you. I took my father-in-law with me on a couple of errands. We, we ran around town, and I stopped at a cash machine. And I took my debit card out, and I put it in the cash machine, and I withdrew money. And he said to me, how would I get one of those cards, and could I be eligible to get money out of a machine? I said, what do you do for money when you need money? He said, well, I either write a check, or I go into the bank and I talk to the teller. Think about the last time that any of you were in to see a teller. I, th I thought about that as I was sitting there through the machine. Of course, I didn't say this to him, but I think it's been five or six years that I've been in to, s to see a teller. So jobs that we think are going to be here forever are going to go away. Policies that we pass in this country will affect employment. Uh, most recently, there's a big debate on minimum wage. And while I would love to see everyone have a minimum wage like North Dakota, that is no minimum wage 
but actually a high minimum wage because of demand for jobs, that I think is the way to do it. What happens when you pass some of these kinds of things is that artificial intelligence and automation take over. For those who travel and you go into airports, you will see out there a great deal of automation taking place already. You now order from an iPad at an airport restaurant. Instead of having 20 people going around and serving, they have two people. You just simply put it in and, and uh, swipe your credit card and your food arrives from the one or two people that now work there. So a lot of those kinds of jobs are going away. That is concerning because there are a lot of folks, if we talk about the 91% that have a high school education, that is good, but only 41% have a, a bachelor's degree and then, or excuse me, 29%, and then an associate degree at 41%, I assume that's technical education. That's good, that is the basis for employment, and if you don't have at least those, your jobs will be outsourced and automated in short order. Now, there's a new book out there called Humans Need Not Apply. Pick it up if you get an opportunity. The first two thirds of the book are excellent. The last third of the book is nothing but predictions, and I, I would predict that most of those predictions will be wrong, but, the book talks about artificial intelligence taking over jobs like driving trucks. <coughs> Think about it. Trains are driven automatically every day in airports. They soon can be driven automatically across long stretches of North America. Those jobs will be eliminated. Truck driving jobs could be eliminated. Uber's goal in this world is to get rid of people driven cars and to own the fleet and to send a car out to your place to pick you up to get you to the airport or wherever you're going without a driver in it. That's Uber's goal in this whole thing. I will tell you just a week or two ago that I was in an Uber vehicle and the man said to me, and this is where I wish I would have had an artificial driver, I, I had a stroke recently. <laughs> I thought to myself, well, maybe it can't come fast enough. Right now it'd be good. Well, so that is really the kind of the force of of markets that are happening out there. And I suspect that within the next 20 or 30 years, we'll see a lot of this come into fruition. And a lot of jobs will be transformed, eliminated, and you will have to be very smart in order to hold a job. Uh, I was chatting with Guy Baker out at Baker Boy recently, who told me that his minimum wage is double that of his nearest competitor, which is in Canada, double the minimum wage. And how he is competing and remains competitive is through the role of automation. He has reduced his number of employees from about 300 to 200, but he's paying that 200 more, and they need a lot more education and a lot more skills and a lot more basic skills. I think there are those jobs out there that will be pretty static. In other words, I was thinking about this over the weekend. Uh, my father graduated from NDSU, and by the way, uh, President Brashani, my father met my mother at NDSU, she was from Laramore, he's from Duluth, I'm a true bison. <laughs> All right, but I would, I would bet that if he were alive today and could go back to NDSU to become a civil engineer, that many of the, s the skills he learned in the early 50s would be the similar skills that he learned today. That's an example of something that's fairly static. Obviously computers and some of the aids that uh, they use today uh, he would have to learn those kinds of things, but those skills are remaining fairly steady. And yet, business wants those kinds of skills, but they also want some duty-ready skills, to borrow a term from my friend Mark Hagrid. I learned that, by the way, when we were traveling around the state. Duty-ready, duty-ready, duty-ready. And duty-ready, according to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Tom Donahue, is the need for flexibility. Employees need to be flexible. They need to be prepared. They need to have a mental narrative in their brain when they come to work. What is it that they're going to do? Who are they going to interact with? And how are they going to interact with those people? They have to be mentally prepared. They have to have concentration and focus. Not only do they have to have concentration and focus, they have to be competitive and self-confident. They also have to have a great deal of skill in stress management and humility. They also need to be adaptive 
and they also need to be able to learn readily. Those are the kind of skills, in addition to the kind of skills that my father learned, or that anybody in this room or within our state, whether you be a plumber, a civil engineer, a doctor, or any number of positions, you need to, in addition to those hard skills, have these skills. I also think that it's really good that our state, uh, under the leadership of the Department of Commerce and Wade Sick, have done the list of high demand jobs. Those are the kind of things that we're going to need to push forward with, uh, with the, uh, the Department of Higher Education. And yet at the same time, I think we need to go one step further than that. We need some kind of market mechanism. You know, the markets are dynamic and fluid and what is uh, really high flying one day is not high flying the next day. Take Apple, Apple's high flying last week and then its stock market value went down dramatically. Why? Because they couldn't introduce a new product fast enough. When I think about buying a new iPhone, and I like the newest, greatest, shiniest thing. Uh, in fact, my assistant at work of often tells me, Andy, you don't need that, you don't need that, you just like shiny things. And I absolutely do, but it translates into market value. So we need to figure out from a higher education perspective, what are those things that are coming up? Not only surveys, they're good, but some kind of market mechanism that works like a business. Because markets are unflinching, they are not sympathetic, and they are immediate. If what you have is not faster, cheaper, and better, and by the way, that is a great new book, Faster, Cheaper, and Better by Charles Duhigg, uh, if you're not faster, cheaper, and better, you'll soon be out of business. So somehow or other, we have to marry that market mechanism to what you do here with higher education and figure out where we're going next. All the great things you're doing are wonderful, but let's take it to the next step. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Drew. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Kathy, I, I know that we're really pressured for time. Do we have time to, for the panel to take a couple of questions uh, from the, okay. Take a couple of questions. Uh, uh, thank you to the panelists for that very in informative, intriguing, thought-provoking, uh, uh, talks. We really do appreciate that. And we'll have time over the lunch break also to talk with you and, and ask questions. How about uh, questions from the audience that you think might have some general applicability? Yes, sir. I, I, I wonder if there's a lot of pressure on liberal arts learning and more career learning and diverse talents. This morning there's an acronym, not just in, in North Dakota. But when you see people are pretty ready, prepare, concentrate, focus, such management, adaptive, run by the these are the types of things that most institutions say they try to do through the general education. Uh, so I guess my question is, instead of revamping all of the majors, should we really be looking more to doing better within our general education to give students that broad platform unless they can sort of leap forward? Does this work? If they're on. All right. So. The question really is, uh, should we focus more on liberal arts to give that or spread it throughout? I, I don't know of a business that would say, listen, you have a liberal arts degree, so we, we're not interested in what you have to offer. In fact, uh, I think that is the role of the interview. When you get into an interview process, you're really trying to figure out uh, you know, how broad that person is, what those kinds of skills are that they have, in addition to some of their technical skills that they bring to the table. Uh, so I think it's really a balance there. I, I don't know that I have a great answer for you, but I would tell you that I've never once heard of a business saying, listen, they just have a liberal arts degree, so they're not useful to us. In fact, oftentimes they make some of the best managers out there. I might add to that a bit as well I, to answer that question. I think it's pretty apparent that our world is no longer rewarding our young people for what they, can, what they know. Google knows everything. I think it is very important the world for us to recognize that the world is only rewarding our young people for what they can do with what they know. So regardless of what, whether you take liberal arts or a career technical, it's critical that every experience we give our students from pre-K through our university system, that it's an application of knowledge rather than just knowledge for knowledge's sake. Anyone else? Very good, good question. Here we go. I don't know if it's on, it's on now. 
Um, so I want to go to the choice idea. A and, and while it's on the surface very nice, let's, how does that intersect with the honesty gap that we have? I mean, you know, there, there, there are children who think they might be the next great neurosurgeon, but they're struggling and are finishing the lowest level of academic preparation in high school. Now, that doesn't mean they can't necessarily become that next great neurosurgeon, but they have to have the, the honesty gap is to sit down with that child and say, listen, to get there, you're going to have to really step up to the plate. Now, I'll, 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 everybody's given a little anecdotal evidence. I have a, one of my mentors was told in sixth grade in Germany he would never be more than a garbage collector. And when he, when he left Berlin and he emigrated to the U.S. and he was a dairy, on a dairy farm and it's only German was spoken at home, he credited the American public education system and our university system in propelling him to an awesome career in science. And he said, I could only have done that in the United States. We don't pigeonhole children in the United States into a career. So let's, I think the choice thing is very important. I think how that intersects with the uh, honesty is also an important issue, and, and perhaps you can address that, because I wholeheartedly agree with what's going on, but I think there's another element that also is very important that was not discussed. I agree. Um, we do, all of us, young adults, young students and adults, we rise to the level of expectation for all of us. And so the sooner that we are able to be informed with evidence and be informed with facts about where we need some extra supports or where we're really excelling, the better off we are and we can continue to receive the supports that are necessary. So people tend to gravitate towards areas that they experience success. And so as they're experiencing success and students are continually reinforced with those successes, they do tend to lead, go in those directions of successes. So I do think that it's important that we close that honesty gap, that we eliminate that honesty gap, if you will, and that we provide challenging opportunities for all of our students with the necessary supports. Yes, I mean, I think uh, every third grade boy during Michael Jordan's time wanted to grow up to be an NBA basketball player. You know, did they, no matter how many free throw shots they, they, they made or how many three point attempts they made, most of them did not end up in being but an NBA basketball player. But as important to not discouraging those dreams, but really identify as early on as we can what their strengths are and begin to provide the supports necessary for them. Very good. I know we are pressed for time. I just want to take a moment to thank uh, the Board of Higher Ed, uh, the Chancellor, and all the board members. I look around. You're all here today. All, all of you have taken the time today. I know a number of legislators who have come here today, the college uh, leadership from around the state of North Dakota. To everybody here, I want to thank all of you and thank our panel uh, for the preparation you made for today and coming in here and sharing your thoughts. Uh, thanks very much, and, and let's enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, Drew, and panelists. Um, during uh, lunch, we'll be starting the interactive portion of this meeting with tabletop discussions led by our Lumina Foundation speakers. They will do a short presentation. And thank you once again to Lumina for their financial support in Envision 2030. Some of you, some of you when you checked in, you were told that uh, um, we didn't have enough uh, box lunches. We do have enough box lunches. You can ignore those vouchers. There's enough lunches for everybody. So we're going to go get your lunch, and you're going to come back really quick, and we're going to get started with our interactive discussion. Ready, break.
In that role, he leads development and advancement of the foundation state policy agenda. A few of his career highlights include serving as education and policy director to former Michigan Governor John Engler and Indiana Governor Mitch Daniels, the director of external relations for Western Governors University, and as a deputy assistant secretary in the U.S. Department of Education in the Bush administration. Scott has a uh, bachelor's of science in political science from the University of Central Florida. He lives in Indianapolis and has two adult children, Carson and Jacob. Susan Hegard has served as a policy and program leader for more than 20 years. Her diverse public and nonprofit service has given her broad perspective, strategic insight, and capacity to act. She is working principally with the Lumina Foundation Strategy Labs, connecting leaders with peers from other states to identify and share solutions that can improve post-secondary attainment and completion. In this role, she serves as a policy advisor to Lumina in Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wisconsin. From 2009 to 2013, Susan was Vice President for Education at the St. Paul-based Bush Foundation, where she led development of a teacher preparation initiative, working with colleges and universities throughout the Upper Midwest. We're very pleased to have Scott and Susan joining us and very appreciative of the financial support from Lumina. Welcome, Scott and Susan. Thank you, Don. Um, we're so happy to be here today. What an impressive turnout. Um, Scott, um, I'm very fortunate to have Scott Jenkins from the Lumina Foundation here. We're going to tag team a little bit, and I think um, in light of the um, time that we have today, we'll talk quickly, but not too quickly, um, and then leave time for questions and answers um, and get you sort of teed up for the important part, really important part of the day, which is the breakout sessions um, um, later on. Uh, so. First of all, I just wanted to thank the team um, that I've been working with for the past few months um, at the system office. Um, Chancellor Hagrat, um, thank you so much. Um, Linda Donlin, um, Lisa Feldner, who I actually began working with when I worked for the Bush Foundation when she was the state CIO, and then Kayla Efforts um, Clevin. Thank you all so much for the work that you've done. You know, when we met back in January, and I met a number of you, um, I just couldn't have imagined um, a turnout like this. Not to say that I knew it would be good, um, but when we talked about the concept of how do you take an economic summit and, then f and, and, and find a way to really connect it with higher education and post-secondary education, um, it's impressive to see um, what you're doing here today. Uh, so my connection to North Dakota um, I was the commissioner at the higher education agency in Minnesota, so I worked on those negotiations um, with North Dakota. You're tough negotiators, that's a good thing. Um, I worked for the Bush Foundation and worked with a number of leaders, I think Steve Shirley uh, at Valley City and um, the folks at NDSU and others. Um, but the most important connection that I have is that my grandfather and my great-grandfather were born in Mandan. Their Danish parents uh, moved here um, a long time ago, and um, brought their their uh, brought their life here. Um, started a company called Mandan Mercantile, and my grandpa and his father grew up in Mandan. So um, it's a wonderful state. So the thing I think that's um, there are many things that are wonderful about North Dakota, but um, you're like a I don't know a big small town in many ways, right? And you all know each other. You may not always n like to know that you know each other. Um, but you know each other, and what that means is that you can get things done in a place like that, and I think that's such an asset. I hope that you don't ever forget how important that is. Um, you have a can-do attitude, and I think just with the data presentations that you've um, seen today, you're out front getting in, fr you know, before the problem and trying to be very innovative in your approach. And I think the fact that you've got everybody in, it's not just higher education's problem or business's problem, it's, it's your concern as a state is really impressive. So with that, um, I'm now gonna hand this off to Scott uh, to talk a little bit about the Lumina Foundation. Thanks a lot. We're gonna just try, try and tag team this back and forth and accelerate through this so we can get closer to, the, to getting you all on schedule for the, your breakout sessions. But a little bit about uh, the Lumina Foundation. Lumina is the, the largest private nonprofit foundation in the US that's focused exclusively on post-secondary education. Our work is defined around what we call goal 2025, which is that 
according to the Georgetown University Center on Education and Workforce, 60% of jobs in America will require some form of post-secondary education by 2030. And that, that goal that we set for 2025 sets our, uh, really our work around state policy that I lead and in, in our work with institutions that, other, that my colleagues lead, our works with communities that, uh, that colleagues lead, and, uh, and all of our investments that we make across the country. Um, so we talked a little bit about the why that, why that, uh, why goal 2025. The, the key I'd like to point out is, is recently we released Stronger Nation, and that is kind of our, our report card to the nation uh, for Lumina Foundation, and within that, this is the first year that you'll see within the North Dakota uh, Stronger Nation pullout, which is in your packets, that we have really tried to get uh, an estimate of, of the credentials that aren't just associate's degrees or higher. Uh, what we're, we've been talking for years in post-secondary education is that certifications, certificates, those, those sub-associate level credentials really matter. And so what we tried to do was really nail that down both nationally and by state, what that number looks like, and 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 part of the part of the the, the brilliance of 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 the sixty percent goal, is, and and by bringing in the issue around certificates, is that 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 the people who earn certificates and are working as welders or plumbers or tool and die operators. Um, or having those certificates and, and working in the oil and gas industry, they're part of the higher education success system. And when you look at the numbers of people and growing that number from 45% to 60% in a state like North Dakota, you start to see that everyone has a, has, a, has a reason for being strongly supportive of your higher education system. And it doesn't become just a private good. It becomes a public good to support the state's economy. And that's why with our goal, that's what we focus on. So in addition, um, why goal 2025? Well, there are a number of reasons, and many of them, of course, have already been touched on today. Economic prosperity, um, continuing that and sustaining that here in your state, improving and sustaining your quality of life, and decreasing disparities. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that um, in a few minutes. But there are societal benefits, economic benefits, and the moral imperative. It's just the right thing to do to take care of um, the populations here. So on the next slide here, I think we're talking about volunteering. So there's data that shows, for example, that with increased education comes greater volunteer level, volunteerism levels in a state. Uh, it, it, with respect to equity and um, diversity in terms of the goal setting, so the important thing here is trying to create opportunities for equal access and success in higher education among historically underrepresented populations. That means students who don't look like me, for example. It also means adults, um, and that would include me. Uh, but for example, the 24% of students you'll see in a minute who have some, who are adults who have some college but not a degree yet, can you figure out interesting and um, um, innovative ways to attract them and focus on them? But no path will get you to your goal without focusing on these underrepresented populations. Everybody needs to be in, and they all matter. And then Kevin Iverson and Kristen's um, presentations on the data really illustrated the change that's not just in front of you, but at your doorstep. 92 languages. I mean, I, I was really surprised um, to hear that. And I think rather than think about that as um, a problem, it really is an opportunity for this state as you move forward. So because of the oil boom um, and this demographic um, shift, I think it's really important to think about um, that change and that when students are left out, when they're not successful, there's a consequence not only for the individual student and their pathway, but when you roll that up, there's a real challenge and a loss, a loss for the state. Um, you're losing a, a, an engaged person who otherwise could really contribute to your economy. But when they're successful, everybody benefits. Um, so I'm not going to go into great depth on the median earnings and tax payments, um, but as you see, income does increase with education. Um, the interesting thing now, and I wish this had been the case when I was in college, um, a person doesn't have a linear path necessarily anymore. They may come in, um, take some credits, take some courses, step out, um, work for a while, and then come back in. But I do want to draw a distinction between part-time 
and completion. So the thing that you really want to strive for is being flexible and, of course, allowing students to be part-time in a way that works well for them and for their employer in the state. But what you want students to do is if they are part-time or full-time, you want them to complete whatever path it is that they're starting. Um, that's where you really begin to um, see the impacts of success. So let's talk a little bit about um, the, some terminology. And so Scott's going to talk about attainment versus completion. Yeah, so we talk a lot at, at Lumina around um, around attainment, and, and sometimes we get confused in states because there's been a huge movement in this country around a completion imperative, and most of that effort has been focused at individual institutions, and at the institutional level, completion is that ultimate goal. Access to the students, success of the student through the course of study, and then to completion. And when we talk about attainment, we're raising up the level. Attainment is really around focusing about your entire higher ec education economic ecosystem within the state. What is your state's talent that you, you can develop and grow that talent? And we know that moving that attainment goal where more and more students have some form of post-secondary credential is going to improve the economy of the state. So the data trend in, in North Dakota. North Dakota, you should be really proud that, that you have one of the highest attainment rates in the country. Uh, you are, uh, when I saw one of the previous charts, somewhere uh, in, the, in the top five to 10 uh, at, a, at, a, at a percentage. The, the interesting thing you'll notice from the new data that we have is that, that your uh, certificates, and what we define as certificates, um, which is different than certification. Certificates tend to be a terminal type of degree, and I use that term cautiously, and to say that it has le learning outcomes that are transparent, um, and it leads to further education and employment, not or employment, but and employment. And typically with a certification, uh, you, uh, you have to renew that over time, whereas with a certificate, it's more of a stabilized uh, type of degree. The, what you're seeing, what you see in North Dakota is a little bit different than what we see in other states. So in, um, when we did this across the country, there were several states that had very high certificate, um, certificate completion rates as a percent of their attainment. Louisiana was one of them. And all of us sat back and go, oh, that makes sense. It's oil and gas and, and all the work and refining around that. There's a lot of certificates that are involved in that process. And then we looked at West Virginia and North Dakota and go, hmm. That may not be it. So we're, the, the, these numbers where we've put a stake in the ground on what the percentage is for the state is an estimate of us trying to get at this number nationally. And what we're doing is we're working with states that are interested either on the high end or the low end to actually find out what that means, to unpack that number with state level uh, leaders. Uh, because this, as I've said, is an estimate. But there's been no one who's really stepped up uh, and until Lumino did this, that actually trying to get a handle on what that number is, what is a credential of labor market value in a state that looks like a certificate. Uh, also, and then you can see what your spread is across, across all of North Dakota uh, of, of these, very similar to the data that was shown earlier. Uh, again, you, if you look to high school graduates and, and those with some college but no degree, you're looking at the other 40% of your, of your uh, attainment in this state. So that is also, as you think about what you're doing today in your breakout sections, sessions, I would really encourage you to reflect on the non-traditional student pipeline. What we've talked extensively about today, and I think what you saw this morning, is what are you doing currently with kind of that 18 to 25 year old population? And I think that's vitally important that you, that you, you, you patch the leaks in that, in that traditional pipeline. But also think as you're trying to move forward, what do you do with non-traditional students? What do you do with students, the 40% who stopped out of your institutions and now may wanna, may wanna come back? And we've seen some states that are really doing some strong adult reconnect programs to bring those people back into post-secondary education and help them finish their degree. And then this is your mix. As Susan indicated, this is your degree attainment rates among North Dakota residents, 25 to 64 by population group. And you'll see that Asian and Pacific Islanders, 60%, uh, and uh, your white population at nearly 50. But it also reveals by doing this where your gaps exist, where do your achievement gaps exist. And I think a lot of times, and I, I, I was probably, when I was working in state policy, you know, 20 years ago, 
30 years ago, I realized, uh, we, I think we all thought that if we could close achievement gaps in K-12, that, the, that, that we would solve that problem for post-secondary. And I think what we found is that those achievement gaps persist all the way through post-secondary, and it becomes an issue that we have to work in post-secondary to resolve, to provide those supports and help those students come through. Uh, because the, uh, the, the, and we have, we have a term of, of art that we're starting to, to use it at the foundation of kind of student-ready institutions. What are the types of, 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 of programs and uh, we, we heard a little bit about, in, uh, you know, kind of intrusive counseling and, and guided pathways and things like that. What are the things we can do to, to help close those achievement gaps? This also shows your, uh, within your pullout, you can see what your uh, attainment uh, rate is at, the, uh, at, the, at your county level. And it's probably reflective of what you, what you all already know from the data you saw today. And Scott, this data is available online um, through the Stronger Nation report. You can um, actually go to the Lumina site and then go to North Dakota and pull the, Correct. the Correct. this down. That's where it came from for your for your packets. So great. So the next slide here, um, I just wanted to ha give you a. I think it's always important. I think as um, the governor and others talked about this morning to look at North Dakota in the context of the region and the rest of the country. And this map reflects attainment across the U.S. Um, North Dakota has a goal in their strategic plan at the system level, um, and it has some components of a strong goal, but there could be some more specific metrics and a clearer focus on equity, um, making sure that underrepresented students and adults, for example, um, students of color and adults are also represented as a, and a, and a priority for your um, state. So if you look around um, North Dakota, uh, Minnesota last year, they, um, they passed an attainment goal. They did it legislatively. Their rate is 70%. Um, South Dakota has a proposed goal in their strategic plan. At, they're do, also choosing um, through a, the system office to do this. That's 65%. Um, North Dakota, I believe, is at 54.5. But their goal, your goal was 20 by 2020 as opposed to 2030. Um, Colorado is at 66%, I believe. Montana is at 60%. And um, the Lumina goal, as Scott mentioned, is 60%. So just wanted to make sure you had a chance to see um, North Dakota in the context of the rest of the country. So how do states go about setting a path um, to greater attainment? Um, so as we mentioned, there's, you set a goal, um, and there are a variety of ways to do that. Um, develop a plan, and then identify metrics to monitor your progress. And my understanding is that um, the board will be gathering feedback from this summit in order to begin to shape and inform their um, strategic plan as they change it. And I thought it was kind of fun this morning to hear about um, reciprocity because I thought, well, here's the great thing about attainment. Like, you get to get those students at your institutions, and then they stay, and they get a job, and or they fall in love, and they stay and work here um, for many, many years to come and raise their families here. So. I think the great thing about attainment is that you get to count everybody, um, everybody in. So what are the, some of the key elements to an ambitious attainment goal? Um, quantifiable, can you measure? You, should, you probably ought to put things in that you can measure as opposed to things that you can't. It ought to be robust and challenging long term, not just for the next five years, but look out 10, 20 years, 30 even. Um, articulated in statute or in the strategic plan for higher education. So as I mentioned, Minnesota um, decided to have a bill and the legislature passed it. Uh, many other states choose to do that through um, their system. And it's really important that it address, uh, address gaps in attainment for underrepresented populations. Um, it really ought to reflect the needs of your workforce and be unique to your state, even though you operate in a global environment. Um, and I think the most in, another really important thing is that it may be on the books, but an, a, a gathering like this where you're actually engaging, engaging a cross-section of stakeholders um, really um, helps people feel engaged and be part of that process. So it's not just owned by one entity. There are three core elements that Lumina looks at when um, looking at attainment. And so one key focus um, is on student outcomes. Another is on aligning your investments um, with those outcomes and with your plan, and then creating smarter pathways. And we heard quite a bit about that this morning as well. So some examples, I think Scott mentioned a few, but um, you've got to figure out what range of policy options um, you want to take advantage of, the ones that are already in existence, the ones you might want to get rid of, the ones you might want to expand. And those include things like your dashboard, outcomes-based funding, financial aid, guided pathways, your great transfer policy that you have in place. Um, more competency-based program, programs and prior learning assessment. 
Um, but again, it has to work for your state. So what's the value of a statewide goal? Well, it sets sort of a North Star for all North Dakotans um, to strive towards. It gets everybody on the same page and makes the case that all have a responsibility, not just the higher ed system, for example, in reaching this goal. Um, using data to inform and measure. I can't um, um, over, uh, overestimate the importance of taking your data, synthesizing it, and using it for to inform your, the work that you're doing, whether it's at the state or the system level, and then using that for continu continuous improvement. You can't improve um, what you're doing without knowing where you are and how you're doing. And again, I think that context of positioning North Dakota um, in the, with the rest of the country and even the world is really, really important. So um, different states, as I said, have taken different approaches. Minnesota decided to pass a law. Um, Indiana, Indiana, they decided to um, work on their goal and do that through their uh, state uh, system, higher ed system process. Um, in Texas, uh, they had a strategic plan as well that was at the higher ed level. And um, in New Hampshire, they had kind of a combined business, I think, higher ed panel that focused on this. Um, and I was just going to ask Scott, do you have any examples in mind of states that have adopted a goal and then have some key policies that they've put in place um, to move the ball in terms of attainment? Yeah, one of, our, one of the states that we, we, we look to as, as kind of a good model on how this happens uh, is, is Tennessee. Um, and the interesting thing about Tennessee is it, it started under a previous governor and then Governor Haslam um, ratcheted it up uh, to... To, to create a, a long ongoing goal called Drive to 55. And Drive to 55, as Susan indicated, became kind of a galvanizing uh, piece of information for not just post-secondary institutions, but students, families, businesses that want to get involved. And what they were able to do under Drive to 55 was they knew what their trajectory was on, on how every institution, where they were at now on their baseline for, for completions and what they needed to get to in order to reach that goal. And they built their budgets around that, they built their finance structure. If institutions were working with business and industry, they came in underneath the Drive to 55 initiative. They created a, uh, a, a, a promise program that supported two-year enrollment. They created an adult reconnect program, which, uh, which pulled, uh, that went out and targeted adults to come back to their technical colleges and finish a degree. Uh, they and everything under it, and, and, and when you talk to the governor's staff, what it did was it provided it provided just a, a way to you know having that overarching goal provided a framework from which to build the the rest of their state policy agenda around that and and uh, and and to galvanize state action around that. They had the highest completion, highest FAFSA completion rate last year with their Promise program, which was less about aligning, which was less about kind of the free college that you hear about, but more about taking the resources you have, identifying stu low-income students, going out, putting them with a mentor, getting them on a pathway towards post-secondary education, and they, in a relatively flat enrollment um, set of years, were able to increase enrollment in their community colleges and their technical colleges uh, because of that outreach, and then they've been also able to bring back adults. Uh, so having that type of galvanizing goal can, can guide policy making, it can guide budgets, and it can guide uh, energy around economic development, commerce, and business and industry engaging with your institutions. So next steps. Um, my understanding is that input is being gathered from this meeting. Uh, there's a board meeting tomorrow, and then there's an important board meeting in June, so the board and the office are working on that. Um, they'll be collecting and, and analyzing and disseminating some of the data and feedback from the meeting um, today. And um, we'll use that um, to help revise their and inform their strategic plan. And so that one of the really key questions is, what do you want for your students, communities, workforce, and state in the future? And then how are you going to get there? Um, this is a great opportunity. It's exciting um, for you to define what the future looks like, what jobs are coming, what education and training will be needed. And so um, I just want to thank you for allowing us to have this opportunity to present before you today. Um, I plan to be here most of the day tomorrow until uh, a little after lunchtime, so if there are those of you who would like to follow up with me or find me, um, please do so. I am doing that. I'm just staying on purpose just to make sure I'm available. But before I close, um, Scott, and we're going to take some questions also from the audience, but Scott, do you want to talk about the grant opportunity that Lumina has? Yeah, so the great thing about working with Lumina is that, that we don't um, – 
by and large, we don't, we don't, uh, we'll never come into a state and say, you will do this. You must do this if you want, if you want Lumina resources. What we do, and, and I've worked in, uh, as Susan indicated, as I was introduced, I've worked both in Michigan, I've worked in Indiana, I've worked in, in Florida, and I worked at the U.S. Department of Education. Um, what I've learned from, although not being able to hold down a job for much more than a few years, <laughs> is that, that when you look at 50 states, you look at 50 states. Each state is different. Each state is unique, has its own culture, has its own structure, has its own uh, uh, norms. And uh, part of the good part about how kind of luminous philosophy is, we have a policy agenda around attainment. And, and really, at the end of the day, if, if a state comes forward and says, we want to work with you on, on improving our graduation rates, we want to improve um, how, how, how our students are successful moving through, we want to go out and and connect with adults. We want to realign our degree programs. We want to look at all the assets in the state that we can deploy for talent development. Then we'll come. We'll help you out. We'll work with that either either through the work that with people like Susan, where we have we have experts and people like at NGEMS um, or other other national experts, Shio, others that we have relationships with that can come that can bring um, their resources to bear, or we have a grant program called uh, the Technical Assistance Fund, and within that grant program. One of the, we have, we have three separate um, grant opportunities. The first one paid for this today. It's just in time um, resources to state agencies, governor's offices, others, because in a lot of times, you, you all don't have the, the $5,000 of money in the margins to support a convening like this of resources. So we want to be able to do that micro grant uh, just in time to get groups together, because a lot of good things can happen when you get a, a group of people like this together. The second one is a grant initiative that, that basically is a is if you're looking at a bigger policy agenda, you're trying to move that through your state or you're trying to align all the policies you get. So in a lot of cases, states will have, you know, you'll, you may have articulation and transfer policy, you may have a uh, policy around need-based aid, you may have a grant program, you may have a whole host of different programs, but you, they may be disparate, they, some may be in a budget area, some of them may be done by the system, some of them may be done by, by other areas of state government, and you want to kind of coalesce those so that so that parents and others understand um, parents and others understand what that looks like. What are the you know so that what is your what is your entire policy framework? So we work with states sometimes to rationalize that. So what does that make? How does that make sense to do that kind of policy scan and and say we're going to kind of rationalize our work? And where I'm from in Indiana, an example of that would be is we had six different on the books funded programs for dual credit, dual enrollment, or concurrent enrollment in the state. And we consolidated all that down to one program and it made a lot more sense for students, it made a lot more sense for parents, and it made a heck of a lot more sense to community colleges and universities that were running those programs. Um, finally, we our largest grant program that we're doing right now is states that take us up on this whole idea around attainment um, and join the other 26 states that have some kind of attainment goal that kind of meets the criteria of, of it's rigorous, it sets a, sets a, a, a number goal, um, it looks at closing achievement gaps, and it's set in some kind of codification that guides policy. Um, if you all want to move forward on that, let us know that you want to do it, and then if you, w the moment you pass that, that attainment goal, you'll be eligible for up to $100,000 in, in technical assistance funds from the Lumina Foundation to support your work in the state to either communicate that to your institutions, Around so communications and messagings, we can't we can't under we can't dismiss what that is, um, or to look at your policies and how do you need to how do you need to modify your policies in order to to reach that attainment goal. Uh, and so we're trying to meet states where they are and where we can help them um, and do those sorts of things. And in some cases, it may be providing some opportunities for you all to go to other states. Maybe I've heard some really great and exciting things today. Maybe it's other opportunities for other states to come here and look at what you're doing. Uh, and, and so things like that, um, you become part of a, a, of a larger network um, in that. And so both Susan and myself, we're happy to help in any way that we can help you move this agenda forward. <laughs> you can do it through your policy. Yep, you've got a board meeting. Yeah, board meeting, you've got one in June, and so can it can be... State statute, board policy, governor's executive order, but I think the fact that you're doing it inside of your um, higher ed strategic plan is great. That seems to be. Meeting every other population quite substantially in attainment rates. Has there been some studies done that have has followed that population through when those kids are in first grade, second grade, or third grade? 
demonstrate our, their culture or their background that allows that to happen. Oh, uh, yeah, one of the things I, I'd look to Kirsten um, and also to your state demographer, you know, to look at some, look through some of the data. So one of the things I can just speak to Minnesota, one of the things they did in Minnesota was that they actually, with their attainment goal work, they looked at the entire African American population, for example, and then broke it down into Somali and other, you know, groups from other places. And in the Asian population, they did, they did the same thing. So. In Minnesota, they have the largest Hmong population in the entire country, but there's also Southeast Asia, there's uh, you know, Vietnamese and Cambodian. And so really getting your data and digging down and looking at those trends over time are important. But um, Kirsten and the department, I don't know if you have. Go here. I will send um, the copy to Linda Donlin of this research, but generally there's been studies of particularly um, segments, cultures that are historically successful over generations. So the study that I'm aware of um, began in the 1960s, and it generally identified that each of these cultures, Asians, Jewish people, that culture that are just generationally successful, have three factors that remain in their families and in their households. Their um, understanding that they were born with a gift and probably have a, a more natural tendency to be successful, have more capacity, more ability than the, the next person. The second factor is the fact that they know that they're not that special, that they, in order to work hard, uh, they, in order to stay ahead of everything, of everyone else, they must work hard, and they have the ability to delay instant gratis gratification for a, a longer goal. So any two of those factors isn't enough. They have to have all three of the factors. So their, their innate sense that they are more special and gifted their understanding that they're not that gifted, that it's hard work that must accompany that, and their ability to prolong or to delay satisfaction. So I'll send that to Linda and she can get that out to the rest of the group. But, but to, to Susan's point, let's also understand that like, Asian is large. Japanese, Chinese, Indian, the Asian subcontinent is so huge. And it's, it's actually, uh, when you look at the global economy, it's what we're, we're, we're all challenged to, to address, face. It's the existential plan. So <clears throat> as we've talked about attainment, and I'm still a little bit murky because, I don't know, maybe I was taken up by the sandwich when you had the attainment definitions up there that you mm -hmm. sort of went through very quickly. But if you look at the UN or the NDUS system, um, you know, it's a sort of vertically integrated throughout higher education. But perhaps one very important area is, is our, our, one of our huge strengths is our community colleges, mm -hmm. okay? And the fact that the community colleges are distributed around the state, I think, is a huge advantage. And so, you know, as if we look at a goal of 60 percent or 65 or 62 and a half or 73, whatever we pick, right, some number, um, you know, do you think that the strength that we have that we can move forward with this is our very effective community college system, and especially that some of those are very well integrated within larger community areas like the Bismarck area um, and the SCS has a has a, a campus right in Fargo another large community area and I think we're beginning to think and focus on those second or third career opportunities for for adults so could you speak to that a little bit and whether we have a strength there what can we do to improve what what I think is a strength how can we make that uh, better? How can we communicate that more to working adults that might want to have a shift in their career or what they're currently doing? So speak to that a bit, Scott. Yeah, Thank you. The, the, your, yes, your community colleges, your, your, uh, your success rate in community colleges is, almost, is nearly double what other, other states see, which is actually probably why your certificate number is relatively uh, suppressed is because you have so many students that are going through and finishing that associate's degree. Um, so a lot of states that are trying to get to an attainment goal are looking to where they have success and where they have a lot of numbers. And so in North Dakota, you have you you have potentially higher enrollments and you have high, and you have uh, quicker success, a, a shorter glide path to success at the community college level. Also, those other states that are that are moving in this direction, especially around adult learners, are not recruiting them back to alma mater. They're not recruiting them back to the to the to the regional comprehensive or the university. They're recruiting them back to the community college or a career technical school so that they can 
so that they can either, if they're in a working job, so they can move from being an LPN to an RN, or they can move in the way where the workforce within that region is hiring. And in a lot of cases, that's not necessarily, although we need to raise baccalaureate degrees along with everything else, but in a lot of cases, those jobs for working adults are in a sub-baccalaureate credential of some kind. So a community college is because you have them spread out and there's opportunities there, and it's a little bit more permeable to get into as an adult who has some college and no degree, uh, because we have to remember that you still have to get in back into those institutions um, if you're trying to get into them. Um, but that, that, that pathway is there. And a lot of the uh, work we're seeing around kind of um, the guided pathways work and the work around intrusive advising is working best at the community college level. I would just add quickly that um, oftentimes your community colleges have close, very close relationships with their employer community. Um, so that's one distinct advantage. And then if you look at the demographics uh, um, of community colleges, oftentimes you'll see, if you're trying to really focus on gaps, um, the demographics of community college will often look different than a four-year state institution. So there's an advantage there as well if you're trying to address gaps. Yeah. Andy. Thank you, Susan. Before I ask my question, I need to point out that your greatest career was at the Minnesota Chamber, which is, uh, yes. Yes, sir. it was a great. All right, well, that all said. Great tour of duty there. Is one of the challenges of, of certificate attainment in our state then if the community college is so strong, the place to get the certificates would be at Wapaton, and yet, we don't have a Wapaton on the western side of the state, the northern side of the state. I mean, it's a fairly li limited group. And what I understand from a lot of folks out west is they're reluctant to send their kids to Wapaton to become a plumber or a welder because <clears throat> they don't get them back. They get over there, they, they get their certificate, they get a job, and pretty soon they're living somewhere around the Wapaton area. And that's not a bad place, but you know, if you're from Dickinson, they want their kids back and they want them working there. The same with adults, I would suppose. I, I think you're, you, yeah. you're recognizing a, a familiar problem in a lot of states that have distributed rural type of programs. I've seen where they've, uh, in, in Michigan, where they've actually distributed some of those degree programs and those opportunities at different colleges where you'll, you'll have the same course of study towards that, but it'll be in different, you, you'll provide, use the, the similar faculty, but they'll be distributed uh, where it's offered. They'll be offered in multiple areas, so an institution that might not have that program could join a collaborative and be part of that program, and in some cases that's been successful. Um, in, in Michigan, they were able to do that through a TAC grant through the U.S. Department of Labor, and kind of common curriculum across those sub-associate level credentials. In the back? Good afternoon, Russell McDonald, President for United Tribes Technical College. Uh, the Wapaton jobs are a good thing, right? <laughs> so, so a very good thing. Uh, but but uh, I, I was just uh, in the model here, and I look at the numbers, and I look at some of the presentations in, uh, in regard to the handouts, and we just, uh, uh, we're kind of having a little bit of a sidebar, not very loud, but uh, where do tribal colleges fit within this model? And we see the attainment of, uh, of, uh, of attainment levels at the associate's degree level. And we also see the disparities for the Native American and African American populations. So where, where are we in this? And I looked in a document for the, for the state and I didn't see us mentioned in there. And I understand it's a North Dakota University System document, but I think the, we need to recognize the importance of tribal colleges within this model and uh, helping the, the Native American population especially to obtain their degrees and then in addition to that we become feeder programs for the North Dakota University system or vice versa. Uh, tribal college is really uh, created because our, our students were going to the mainstream colleges and not having success. So we created these, our predecessors created these tribal colleges and, and uh, our students came back and started completing their degrees with us. So I think there's a, I think we, I think we do a good job of that. And I think we need to consider that in regard to the model and, 
and in regard to this other part, my, my bachelor's and master's are in sociology, and this idea that uh, if we concentrate on the, on the most, uh, where there's the most gain to be made, like the Native American and African American populations here, then we raise the whole society. And all of you scholars in here, I think, will agree with me on that, and thank you very much. Great, great question. So I think one of the important things to, to, when you think about an attainment goal, it really is everybody in. And so that would include tribal colleges. And you know, we didn't call that out specifically, but tribal colleges and private colleges um, for that matter. So in Minnesota, when we, and I use that as an example because that's where I live and I'm most familiar with that and the goal's pretty recent. They are still having, um, they passed the goal last year, but they're having statewide meetings and um, of stakeholders and the private colleges and the tribal colleges are at the table. So. Um, I would say that it's important to have um, engagement um, in all sectors. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you, Scott and Susan. Um, you should have breakout sessions. They sh were a part of your packet. Just remind you, there's breakout sessions on both sides. We did want to save a couple of trees. Um, and pick out a session that you're passionate about. We are, um, there will be staff members available to assist you on the outside to find, find the different rooms. These are working sessions. We want, we need your ideas. Then we'll come back and, and discuss and where we want to take higher education in 2030. What we're going to do is we are going to take a break. We will start the sessions at 1.30, and then we will reconvene back here at 3.45. Um, before we do that, as we break out, let me just remind you that, uh, keep this in the, as, as context, there is a, a new game in town for all of us in higher ed, and that new game is about globalization. It's about intellectual capital, it's about consolidation, and it's about data. And we have to learn the rules of this new game, how the rewards are distributed, what are the best practices. Or we have another option. We can continue practicing our present skills and become the best players in a game that's no longer being played. As North Dakotans, we choose not to do that. Okay? So, um, ready, break. Mark. <laughs> Twenty thirty, but then you have some intermediate goals. Where if there's something urgent, a thing like the whole student, there's something like you know, there's this health thing the governor is talking about. You know, here's something urgent. Also, like manufacturing, Mr. Alders, I was in WEAC, Workforce and Education Advisory, lots of clarity on health care. But in manufacturing, is like, do we strive to be a manufacturing automated 3D printing place, or do we not? That if you come back saying, wow, this was really hard. That's okay too, because remember, this is all going to become a one year, year and a half effort. This is just the kickoff. So if you can't do those goals, as I'm saying right, Linda, three, five years, and 23, but if you just come back saying, lots of disparity on what is law in 2030, that's okay too, all right? So don't feel like you got to come to an agreement if you really don't have consensus. And Dr. Kipson. Okay, Don, 315 or 345? Um, we will reconvene here at 345.